Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, Paul is talking with the co-founder of Savage Gentleman, Josh Tyler. Josh is a man on a quest to reach his full potential and to help others do the same. As a school teacher turned professional fighter and amateur survivalist, his wild and varied experiences led him to co-found Savage Gentleman with Matt Winslow. Like the company's namesake implies, he is a walking juxtaposition of this dichotomy of masculinity. As a husband, father, fighter, and philosopher, Josh continues to explore and improve upon both aspects and encourages all men to do so as well. If you enjoyed today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review at the top of the show page on Spotify or at the bottom of the show page if you are listening on Apple Podcast. Your opinions matter and your ratings help us to grow, help more people to be healthy, find freedom of body and mind, and to live their dreams. And now here is Paul talking with Josh Tyler on the topic of manhood in process. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, I'm going to talk about something that's very important, probably, I would say, bordering on extremely serious, and that's the issues of men and the challenges they're facing in the world, both the young men that are having a hard time becoming men and the men that are men that are having a hard time being men. So the title of our show today is Manhood in Process, because it is an ongoing process. My guest today, as you heard from Penny, is Josh Tyler. I was connected to Josh by uh, one of the producers at Gaia TV, who knows me and loves my work, and met Josh and said, you need to meet this guy. I think he'd be great on your podcast. And that was Julie Ross from Gaia TV. So I looked into Josh and checked him out and thought, yes, he's got an interesting background and he's doing a lot of work to help men. And I loved his um, Savage Gentleman Forum for Men, which we'll get into later in the podcast. Um, Josh has a background as an MMA fighter. He's worked on developing survival skills with survival expert. He's a husband and a father. He has experience running men's groups. He's worked with plant medicines for his own healing. He's the co-founder of Savage Gentleman, a retail brand from and men's forum based on the need to help men integrate the savage with the gentleman within themselves, which I love. And uh, he's also the host of the Savage Gentleman podcast. So, Josh, it's a pleasure to have you on the podcast with me today. Paul, I'm really happy to be here, man. And we've had some good conversations leading up to this, and I'm really excited to continue some of those. Yeah, me too. I just wanted to say that uh, as we kick off the podcast today for the listeners, I'd like to point out that I've been a therapist, trainer, coach, uh, teacher, and life coach for 39 years, which has given me a chance to interact with a lot of men. I also have a lot of students in the Czech Institute that runs men's groups and do healing work specifically for men with life challenges. So as I shared with you, Josh, I reached out to a number of men that run men's groups and are also highly developed and have done a lot of work on themselves to gather sort of a consensus of what they're seeing out there. So it wasn't just based on my opinion alone or yours. But I wanted to see, because I trust these guys, they're all real sharp and they work hard and they're real leaders. So the people that I worked uh, with and consulted to gather a bunch of information just to get my finger on the pulse to make sure I had a sense of what was going on on a bigger scale than my own personal experience is Michael Holt, who is a Czech professional and a professional bodyguard and runs men's groups. Mike Salemi, uh, most of you would know him. He's been on my podcast multiple times. He's a famous kettlebell athlete, Czech professional, and host of the PATH podcast. Troy Casey, the certified health nut, most of you would know. He's a Czech professional and a media personality and runs men's groups. Michael Pratt is a Czech professional, has served as our chef, and he's the teacher of our children. He also runs men's groups. Jonathan Bluestein who's been on my podcast a couple of times, is a genius. He's a lawyer, martial arts master, an author, a teacher, and a practitioner of traditional Chinese medicine. 
I reached out to my son, who's a level four check practitioner. He's got two kids. Uh, I mean, four four boys. One one uh, that's my grandson. Three with his partner, and he has a lot of experience working with young men. He works with them every day. And as he said, I swim in the minds of teenagers. <laughs> that's what he told me by text. So he shared his insights. I reached out to Kyle Kingsbury, Czech professional, host of the Kyle Kingsbury podcast, which is excellent. He's a retired professional MMA fighter, and he man he's a farm manager and a sustainable living practitioner and one of the uh, guides for Aubrey Marcus's Fit for Service group. And he is a husband and a father, and he's one of my best buddies. I also spoke to Mickey Willis. I also spoke to, and Mickey Willis, if you don't know, is a movie producer who produced the world famous Plandemic series. He's an educator. He's somebody that I consider to be a real man and have very deep respect for his opinions and challenges that men are facing today. And he's actually producing a movie right now on the challenges men are facing in the world. And I'm going to share in a minute here as we kick the podcast off what Mickey Willis wrote to me when I queried him about the issues men were facing because it was quite shocking and revel revelatory. I also reached out to Monsell Denton, leader of Sacred Hunts and Men's Groups, and he's been on my podcast, so if you want to track Monsell down, very, very interesting and deep guy, and he shared a lot of insights with me as well. So, Josh, to begin our journey into the challenges of manhood, I, I'd like to share this overview uh, that Mickey Willis shared with me. And um, it was pretty potent. Um, and then we can jump into our dialogue from there. Yeah, that sounds great. Mickey Willis wrote back to me when I, I asked all these experts, could you give me the three to four key challenges men are facing? in your work with them and, and their challenges in the world today. And I asked for the three or four challenges that young men are facing that's stopping them from becoming men. And I was actually going to put all of the feedback they gave me into the podcast outline and read it, but they gave me so much information. It turned out to be like a 10 page document. So it probably would have taken me about 30 or 40 minutes just to read it all. But there were some very, very common themes running throughout. So I took the key points and, and sort of structured it into our podcast today. So here's what Mickey Willis had to say. As a father of two young boys and the founder of a school, I'm acutely aware of the challenge in Amer challenges American boys face today. First, it is important to understand that the U.S. is under siege of a cultural revolution similar to what China went through under Mao Zedong. A cultural revolution is necessary to gradually force a population to accept radical new ideas and rules. It's about stripping away everything worth living for so that the people will be less motivated to resist. This is why Marxist movements always declare the need to disrupt the nuclear family. What is more precious and worth fighting for than the family? Because it's men who protect nations, there is a war against masculinity. The softening and feminizing of boys and men serves a plan forged by enemies, both foreign and domestic, to break down and capture America from within. Of the numerous cultural and social challenges boys face today, dating and mating are among the most challenging. The Me Too Believe Women movement has done great damage to the traditional relationship structure. Men are no longer safe to fulfill their primal role with an intimate relation within an intimate relationship anything resembling testosterone has been demonized as toxic there are countless videos on social media showing women shaming men for acts considered chivalrous such as holding open a door or offering assistance at a gym and reading that makes me sick unfortunately this trend goes much deeper and darker the lives of too many young men have been destroyed by false rape allegations over the last few years. The new rule, guilty until proven innocent, puts our young men in a dangerous position when dating. 
It only takes one vindictive young lady to make an accusation. Her reputation benefits as a victim, while his reputation is forever tainted, affecting every aspect of his personal and professional life forever. So how do we protect our boys from getting snagged in this trap? My boys are 8 and 11. Even in their preteen ages, we have deep discussion about this stuff. They get it, too. They are fully aware of the world they're inheriting and the obstacles they'll face soon. That said, I will not allow my boys to succumb to a corrupt system. We can only be defeated by not holding to our true nature. We will not play these social games because we understand where they lead. No one wins. The real losers are those currently pushing these anti-human agendas. The path they're on is a one-way road to loneliness and psychosis. My boys are learning to be men, real men, men who assist and protect women, men who operate from honor, respect, and reverence. Thankfully, the part of the, te- the part of Texas we live in is where that sort of thing is still welcomed. And once again, that's Mickey Willis, father, filmmaker, and real man. <laughs> so, you know, when I I got a lot of feedback, but the one thing that Mickey did is he identified the etiology, the cause of all this, where mm-hmm. this is all coming from. And this, you know, as most people listening know, this is hand in hand with the Great Reset. It's what COVID was all about. That's what the masking was all about, breaking down the family unit. And as you and I were talking, Josh, uh, just before we we started recording, I quoted some of the statistics that were sent to me. Michael Pratt sent me this statistic, which was really sad. Um, There is a substantial mental health stigma among young men. Reaching out for mental help is often seen as a weakness or not being good enough. Because we don't want to be considered weak, we ignore the signs telling us to get help and bury uh, bury the issues. Men committed suicide four times more often than women in 2020. Men make up 49% of the population and are nearly 80% of all suicides committed. That's a pretty shocking statistic. And, you know, 2020 was right in the beginning of COVID. So it Mm -hmm. probably got worse. I mean, I saw the statistics just get worse and worse. So with that preface, Josh, you've covered a lot of ground in your life so far. You've engaged life as an uh, an MMA fighter, Mm -hmm. a survivalist, businessman, actor in movies, husband, father, working with men and more. I'm sure you found the edges of yourself multiple times. So to begin with, I'd love it if you can share some of your history, how you became aware of and interested in the challenges men are facing today and young men are facing today and helping them. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I'd say finding the edges is a very accurate uh, description. And that's (laughs) kind of been really my path is just to push the envelope and, and figure out, you know, how far I can take something in a, in a particular direction. I know that. I know that well. <laughs> yeah. You, you are, are very much a kindred, kindred spirit in that way, <laughs> you know, and, and I, I'm not in, entirely sure where that started. Um, I, I feel as though I have kind of always been that way. And, and one of the litmus tests for me is in pursuing something is how difficult and how challenging is it? How uncomfortable does it make me? And if it's a lot, then I typically, that's where I go. And <laughs> that's how you grow. <laughs> it, it is. And it's, a. I mean, he, and I'm going to start this whole thing off just so everyone knows, like, I don't necessarily recommend anyone follow me. Like I wouldn't follow <laughs> me. I wouldn't follow me through a buffet line because you may not get the result that you want. Like you may not be happy with the way things turn out. Um <laughs> So, so this isn't like, Hey, everyone do exactly like I did because, um, I mean, you're, you're welcome to, but you know, individual results may vary. It's a foolish, I mean, it's, it's a, uh, maybe not foolish, but it's a interesting way to approach life as to, you know, just seeking out 
different challenges and, and becoming uncomfortable in, in as many ways possible. But what that's done is it's given me a lot of perspective and it's given me a lot of life lessons um, that's allowed me to help others, I think, hopefully navigate uh, the things that they're going through. So, I, I mean, I'll say I don't have the answers to anything. Like I have no answers for anyone. Uh, my goal, what I've tried to do is just help people ask better questions because that's, and that's really all you can do. Like no one can give you the answer, but if you ask better questions, I, I think it'll lead you to a place where you may want to be as if where you are, isn't that place already. Yeah. What are some of the things that you've done to, to kind of explore yourself? I mean, yeah. Obviously, you know, the things I mentioned, MMA, mm -hmm. but, 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 you know, talk about some of these things and, and what you learn from them. Certainly. So it started with, you know, I wanted to be a professional athlete from the time I was small. Um, and unfortunately I stayed small my entire life. I'm not a huge guy. I thought football was going to be the direction. And in my pursuit of, of football, I f found wrestling had a knack for that. and wrestling kind of carried me into college. So I wrestled division one at old dominion university because it was the hardest thing that I could imagine doing. Um, it was so challenging. And yet there was something about that challenge that I found rewarding, like the, the competition that, you know, when you talk about, and we can dive into this a little bit more, you know, rites of passage, there's very few, I think, modern rites of passage than going through and, and completing a wrestling career, be that at the high school level or, you know, at the collegiate level. It's, you know, it, it definitely carries you from being a boy and into becoming a man. So there's a lot of lessons that I learned from that. I didn't achieve my goals that I had set for myself. So I still had that itch to compete. And that's where I found mixed martial arts. So from there, I started mm -hmm. training MMA. Um, found, hey, this is a lot of fun and I'm actually kind of decent at it. And while I was a, a teacher, so I went to school to be a, a teacher, a PE teacher, so health and physical oh, education. Good, yeah. And so I did that for a little bit. And simultaneously, I had taken my first amateur fight. That went well, pursued that. And I got to the point where I kind of had to shit or get off the pot as, okay, am I going to be a teacher for the rest of my life or am I going to pursue this fighting career? And fighting one out. And so I turned pro and did that for about 10 years. And it's really interesting looking back how much that did teach me. Obviously, there was a lot of skills that I gleaned, you know, as a martial artist and, and in fighting. And, you know, I'd say that I'm probably the okayest pro fighter that most people have never heard of. Um, you know, I, <laughs> I, I did it for a while and I had success. I won a lot more than I lost, but you know, I never made that huge stage. And that was always the goal. I had a few fights in Bellator, got to fight in and outside of the, the country, which was a lot of fun, trained with some of the best guys in the world, got to coach and work with them, but you know, never really, you know, won that UFC championship belt that a lot of guys, you know, want to hang their hat on. And it, it, it really, what that taught me was that the, the destination isn't necessarily the point. It is, it is the, the journey to get there, the path that we walk um, in pursuit of that, that really kind of helped forge me into becoming the person that I am. And all the ups and downs along the way, people ask, man, if you could change anything, if you go back, you know, and change this. And a lot of fighters say, oh, I would have done this differently in a fight so that I could have won. But I look mm -hmm. at those losses and as, as hard as they were, and as painful as they are even now, sometime to think about like, man, that was just not my day. I wouldn't be who I am without that. So to go back and change it, man, I, I don't think that that would be the best course of action. So going through and, and having these experiences is, and, and when I say forging, man, for, you know, I know you're, you were a boxer and have had your fair share of scraps in your day. There's something about getting into a fist fight with another human that, you know, really does teach you a lot about yourself and, and what you're made of and what you're capable of and what you're not. And I think that's a big part of what we as men don't get enough opportunities to find out about ourselves. That's a, not necessarily that you have to fight. That's, that's just, you know, the simplest and most primitive, I think, expression of um, any kind of athletic endeavor. 
Yeah, I, I think, you know, I think one of the challenges that we have is we've got a culture based on not only a culture, but a world culture based on winners and losers. Mm -hmm. And so I think what happens is because we stigmatize the losers as something less, that we, we actually end up putting ourselves as athletes and other people do it too. They put a person in a state where they feel diminished because they lost or they feel like they're not going to get remembered or whatever. Mm -hmm. But a long time ago with my students, you know, I, I, cause, because I do so much therapy on people and I track back, you know, why does a person have digestive trouble or for example, uh, small intestine problems psychologically are connected to fear of criticism. Wow. So if a, per if a person's got fear of criticism, then they also are going to have a big fear of losing because losing always comes with criticism. And a lot of people, even if it's constructive criticism, they still carry a lot of guilt and shame and, and self-denial. So I personally, I, I, I never really had that. I don't know why, but when I was a fighter and I was also a kickboxer, not just a boxer, hmm. I used to I used to say, look, I train so hard. The first guy that I want to give a hug is anyone that can beat me in the ring because they're going to have to earn it. Yeah. You know, when I, when I fought on the army boxing team, our slogan was our job is to give our enemies, our opponents maximum opportunity to lose. So we trained to give everyone that competed against us maximum opportunity to lose. And so my philosophy was, if you can beat me at any sport, then you've just become my teacher. You're the guy I want to mm. study because you've obviously got something that I don't have. So I've been trying to promote the idea, instead of winners and losers, winners and learners. So I'm not a loser. I'm a learner. And yeah. I think, the, the, I think any, any of us that shows up half-cocked, whether it be at work, whether it be in bed with our woman, whether it be in racing, I know I was a motocross racer, a stock car racer, drag racer, showing up half prepared, that's your own stupidity. Then it's okay to have the guilt and the dis disappointment in yourself because you know you, you're not really fully participating, which means you're not even challenging the rest of the guys very well. So you're not contributing to your own growth nor to their growth. But if you really are doing your very best, and you're centered in yourself and you lose, then you've met your teacher. And then it mm -hmm. makes it even more exciting because now you know that there's more to learn and there's more growth to be done. And that's what life is all about. So I think probably our first offering for men out there is to just take the word loser and put learner in there and look at all the areas where you think you haven't done well and say, how did I, what did I learn? And how can I? develop a system of self-reinforcement that takes those challenges and mistakes and becomes my inner cue for what I won't do again. You know, yeah. like for example, when I was a competitive triathlete, I represented the army in triathlon and um, I noticed a lot of guys wouldn't train on days when it was really nasty weather, like raining and windy. They would make hmm. excuses. Or they would just put their bicycle on the stand and ride it in the building. And, and for me, I'm like, aha, today's the day I get to make one step closer to my competitors because I'm going to go out in the nastiest weather and train as hard as I can. And the shittier it is, the more I'm going to get into it because I mm -hmm. know Inevitably, with triathlons, you get extreme heat, cold wind, and people talk, that talk themselves out of it in training will talk themselves out of it in competition. Yep. So I trained myself to be comfortable with the uncomfortable, and for, fortunately or unfortunately, I was raised on a farm with a, with a father that had zero tolerance for excuses mm. and only rewarded um optimal performance with food. <laughs> if wow. you didn't do well, you didn't eat. And if you 
didn't do well enough, you might get beat up. So you, you learn to perform. So by the time I got into competitive sports, it was all easier than my dad, you know, yeah, it's like, okay, no problem. <laughs> it's like, okay, this is a, no problem. You know, the, you know, what's interesting. And I didn't realize this until, until recently, um, the, my, my true drive to compete and pursue all these things actually came from a curiosity. Um, just being curious, how good am I? You know, what have I learned? What have I assimilated? And how well can I put it to practice? And and this yes. is a very different ideology from winning and losing, right? It's it's an experiment. Hey, I have an idea about what my capabilities are, and I have an idea on how to improve them through my training. But I don't know if it's actually working or not until I put it in into some kind of a competitive um, arena, right? And, and test it, right? I mean, this is this is really it's the scientific method, or as I like to call it, fuck around and find out, right? You have yeah. some ideas, mm -hmm. you mess around with it, and then you get a result and you see. And so, having to and, and I've got a competition actually coming up. I um, decided it's been far too long. I mean, I'm not fighting. I'm re retired from fighting professionally anymore, but uh, I've got a jujitsu competition. It's a super fight as they call it against another, another very well-seasoned black belt. And it was one of those things where it's like, well, do I need to compete at this stage in life? Do I have anything left to prove to the world? No, but to myself, I'm curious. I, I'm curious as to, okay, what can I do with what I have with the training and the amount of time that I can dedicate with everything else that I have going on? Can I optimize that in such a way that allows me to execute and perform at my best when it, when it matters? And so, you know, in a few weeks, we're going to find that out. And, you know, either that guy is going to have something for me that I can't deal with, or it's going to be a, you know, it's going to be a long day for him. But either way, I'm going to get some results, you know, some knowledge as an insight into where I am currently at. And I think that that's, that is the value. Whether I get my hand raised or not is is kind of irrelevant. It's okay, maybe I'm not as good as I thought I was, or like, okay, wow, what I'm doing is really working well. This is a model that, you know, I should continue to follow and perhaps something that I can share with someone else that they could use. And that's another part of it too, is like, man, I can't sit up here and talk about all this thing of like, man, you've got to work hard, you've got to be dedicated, you've got to be disciplined, you've got to constantly improve yourself and then not be practicing that in some um, appreciable way. And again, that's not to say that every single guy who's a teacher has to continually compete. I think there's a certain point in your life where you're like, box check, man, I don't have anything to prove to anybody, you know, but for me, you know, I still have that itch. And, and I think it would be, I'd be doing a disservice to myself and to others to not, to not occasionally scratch it. Yeah. Uh, I think that's important. And, you know, you, you just, you have to listen to your inner self, right? And, and if there's a call to keep growing that part of yourself or, you know, put yourself into a position where you get a, a, a legitimate challenge, it's like you said, it's like a measuring stick. And it's also a nice way to see, you know, do I still enjoy engaging in that form of competition after you know, many years of professional competition and having a break. You know, w one of the things that, that you brought up in, in me as I was listening to you talk is that my observation of young men especially is that they're addicted to instant gratification, you know, mm -hmm. to, to be good at wrestling. I wrestled when I was in elementary school, and then I transferred from there into boxing. But um, one of the things that sports like wrestling, boxing, triathlon, to be good at any sport, you, you got to get rid of the idea of instant gratification. And, and, you know, the whole biohacking industry is really about instant <laughs> gratification. And, um, and so is, you know, using steroids and, and, and there's just a, a, you know, a radical upswing of, of people using testosterone replacement therapy without actually doing the things that anyone can do to produce testosterone naturally. Unfortunately, there's a lot more 
education on how to trick the system than there is on how to work with the system. Um, but the point I'm bringing up is I, I think I think a lot of this has to do with video games. I think it has to do with the speed of technology. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, research shows that every click someone has to make on a website reduces the chance that they're going to stay on the website or buy anything. So you're talking about the push of a finger. You're, what is that? Like, you know, a, tw a quarter of a second, right? So people mm -hmm. are so, so after the instant sweet spot that they won't stick with anything. Hardly anybody reads books anymore. All the way back when I wrote my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, mm -hmm. in 2000, when, uh, right before we published it, I had appointments with 10 literary agents, I mean, with 10 publishers. I had a very good literary agent. But the statistics at that time, because I did a lot of research, Penny and I did, just to, to find out you know, key things about how long should the book be, how should it be structured. And at that time, which was, you know, this is 2023, that's 23 years ago, 90% um, of books were not read past the first chapter. Wow. Any book that wasn't written at eighth grade level or below did not perform well. <laughs> and 90% uh, of all books printed never made it past the first print run. So. That was 23 years ago. And what, what that was telling me is people actually don't even have the discipline to, to read a book mm -hmm. and to, to really do the work to harvest the knowledge out of a book. And, and then we saw internet times shortening, like, you know, video times in order to get people to, to, to stay with it started getting shorter and shorter and shorter until you, now you got, you know, one minute videos on Instagram and all these other things. And I'm like, how do you, how do you tell anybody anything in a minute? Yeah. You know, it's worse than that. Um, I just saw something the other day. And, and again, you can look at social media as being kind of the canary in the coal mine on this, right. And, and, and the prevalence yeah. of, of TikTok, which is, yes. is incredibly short. And, and it's really, it's just like, you know, virtual cotton candy. Is all, there's no substance to it. There's no real um, anything to it, but people will just sit there and stuff their face with it. And it's just these little right. short sugary bursts. Uh, I think on Instagram, it said now for the reels, they're now the algorithm is, is pushing three to six second reels. So if you're, if, if you're, what are you going to accomplish in three to six seconds? What meaningful piece of information can you deliver in that? generally not a ton, but that's where we've come to in people's attention span, sadly. And I, and I personally, I blame, you know, the, the evolution of society and our level of comfort. We are so comfortable that we don't have to be inconvenienced by hardly anything. If we really don't want to, right? You can, you don't have to make food. You can just push a button on your phone and someone will show up and bring that to you. You can, you, you don't have to go outside and get your heart rate elevated. You don't really technically have to do anything and you can still exist in our society. Uh, the problem is, is that's a, it's a, it's a poor existence and it's not what this meat suit and the, the uh, spirit and soul that dwells within it were designed for. And so we have this technology that has outpaced our evolution and we still have these very primitive um, bodies and, and minds and hearts. And I say primitive, not as a bad thing, but as, you know, more of an, in, as far as like primal, right? Where we want to be able to do things and, and we're used to and accustomed to doing it the hard way. And there's a deep satisfaction from being challenged and, and a delayed gratification. And we're completely leapfrogging over that. And now people wonder why they're so unfulfilled. And it's like, well, you have you haven't done anything to deserve the things that you have. And so, yeah, you, you feel some kind of way about it. You're in this existential crisis because you are simply existing and not actually living and doing things of substance. Yeah. And that's definitely come by way of all the technology. Mm -hmm. You know that I'm 61. So 
when I was a kid, there wasn't fax machines yet. There was only rotary dial phones. There was no cell phones. I, I was raised without a television. My father's belief was television is going to distract you from your farm work. <laughs> and that ain't going to happen around here. And, you know, he, he, he was a special effects man for Universal Studios. So he knew the movie industry inside and out. And they didn't get a television in the house till I was 16, which is the year I left home. And um, it only got, I think, two channels that were black and white. And they mm -hmm. came in and out with the weather. And you had to move the aerials the all the time. Mm -hmm. And one of them was the BBC News, which was boring as hell. So, um, you know, I, I really, I remember going to my friend's house and thinking that commercials were the coolest thing <laughs> in the world. You know, I'm like they were always laughing at me because I like to watch the commercials because I'd never seen anything like that. You know, having been around as long as I have, I've watched as computer technology has gotten faster and faster and the amount of information people are being exposed to has gotten more and more. Um, I can't remember which book it was. I think it might have been um, The Body Electric by Robert O. Becker, if I remember right. But he, he cites in there that today the average person processes and is exposed to more information in one day than a person in the year 1900 and prior was exposed to in their entire lifetime. Wow. So I think what happens is people, you know, imagine you are working for the FDA on a, uh, on a, on a, a line where you have to check chickens for diseases. Well, if you were supposed to check one chicken a minute and then the line started going faster, you'd have to go faster and faster. And so as the information, the chickens represent information, go faster, then we're trying to get to the nugget of whatever we're supposed to be getting quicker and quicker and quicker. And so that be, sort of becomes like a, it's, it's like when you're running downhill and your legs start going so fast, you can't control them anymore. And next thing you know, you're having a rock sandwich, you know. <laughs> um, uh, I, I think that all of this stuff is a double-edged sword. It can help you, but it can also really mess you up. Yeah. Hello, everybody. March is the final month for the next intake of Czech Academy students. Your applications will be accepted until the last day of March. Czech Institute CEO Gavin Jennings and I created the Czech Academy to provide a multidisciplinary integrated learning and teaching system for the mastery of holistic health. The Czech Academy teaches each student how to assess each client physically, emotionally, and mentally, and develop a program that supports them in achieving their dream. You not only learn the essentials of diet and lifestyle modification, but how to design corrective and high-performance exercise programs scientifically. As I suspect you are all aware, there has never been a bigger need for truly holistic health professionals than there is today. So why not learn to master your own health and well-being and make a great living helping others create health, freedom, and live their dreams? The Czech Academy offers anyone genuinely interested in learning, practicing, and teaching holistic health principles and practices as an approach. The Czech Academy is ideal for anyone genuinely interested in learning, practicing, and teaching holistic health principles and practices. The Czech Academy is ideal for exercise professionals, allied medical professionals, therapists, or doctors interested in mastering the core principles of holistic health. You will learn all the assessment methods, program design skills, coaching, and behavioral change skills needed to enhance your existing practice or start in a fresh holistic health career. Czech Academy students are taught by the most skilled holistic health professionals in the world and supported by mentors and student forums. Scholarships are available, so apply now. We have one scholarship per region. We have the North America region, the South Pacific region, and the UK Europe region. Applications are welcome from new students and existing students within the Czech education system that are ready to join the Academy and achieve mastery. To register for the Czech Academy, go to chekacademy.com. Once again, to register for the Czech Academy, go to chekacademy.com. We look forward to receiving your application by the last day of March. If we work together, we can bring real healing to the world. One of the things I, I wanted to ask you was... What is it that got you interested in men's groups 
and wanting to work with men and, and what, what have you first, what got you into it? And then what did you find? Yeah. You know, it was kind of, a, um, just a serendipitous thing. Obviously being a teacher, I like to work with people and, and, you know, impart knowledge and working with kids in, in the school system was great. But what really, what I found fascinating was working and, 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 and actually teaching other men. And I saw this in, in combat sports where you take a guy who, you know, as I had become a little bit more experienced and was able to actually like show skills and, and teach and help guys who were newer to the sport. What came of that was really powerful. And, you know, and then I started seeing it outside of just that, you know, small sphere of, of mixed martial arts as I, as I delved into the survival world and the preparedness, self-reliance aspect. And, and now you are, you're working with adult men from all different um, walks of life. But when you see those guys get a piece of knowledge that allows them to be self, more self-sufficient and more self-reliant, like that it was a profound change that you could like feel occurring and 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 I was like that's it that that right there and that was kind of the the initial impetus to uh start up savage gentlemen which became a podcast at first just to talk about some of the concepts and things that we were seeing but it you know I knew that it had to go beyond just talking about the ideas you you had to actually implement it you know there had to be some kind of a practice where you're, you're giving guys the ability to learn and, and, and physically and mentally and spiritually grow, not just, you know, chat about all these really esoteric ideas. And so that's, that was kind of what sent me down that path of like, okay, this is very needed. And it, it just, it lit something up inside of me to see this guy who showed up, who maybe couldn't do a lot of things, didn't have a lot of confidence, was struggling with all these other components in his life. And then you give him this tool and it's almost like you're putting a weapon in his hand. And, and it, like this guy now has a battle ax that he can, you know, metaphorically tackle his problems and approach life from with the confidence that, Hey, I can handle myself. I, I may not be able to handle every situation that, that occurs, but I'm at least more prepared and more self-reliant and self-sufficient than I was yesterday. And again, that, that kind of became the, 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 foundation for savage gentlemen of just you know a continual pursuit of improving in as many ways as we we possibly can a thought a couple of thoughts came into my head while you were talking Uh, one you know there's the old saying knowledge is power i'm Mm -hmm. sure you've heard that before but i tell my students knowledge is not power applied knowledge is power Mm -hmm. and one of the things that's happening today with all this information in the internet is you get all these young people surfing the internet all the time, filling their heads full of all sorts of stuff, but they don't ever actually take the time to test things to see if it works. And so I get these young people in my classes that will start arguing with me on things that I obviously can tell they don't even know what they're talking about, but they've got these really harsh opinions about it. Like, I'll give you a good example. Um, I was co-teaching a class with my wife, Angie, who she, she runs our holistic lifestyle coach department. And I came in to visit the students and give a little presentation. And she pulled me aside and she said, this guy over here been arguing with me for the last three hours. Cause he's been drinking five cups of coffee a day. And he has all these articles he's brought with him showing that coffee is good for you. Caffeine's good for you. And I looked at her and said, have you got his health appraisal questionnaire? She said, "Yes, look at it, and it's you know, his adrenals are fried. He's got liver detox, liver toxicity problems, and he was just off the charts." Mm-hmm. I said, "Well, didn't you show? Didn't you just show him?" She said, "Yes, but he he's not listening to me. I need you to address this with the students." And so, you know, there's a a, a classic example, and and why I'm bringing that up is because I think one of the key things men and young men need to do. And this goes to something my buddy Jonathan Bluestein said in my podcast with him two podcasts ago when we were talking about the issues of COVID and all this, you know, taking people's sovereignty away. 
He said his first recommendation for everybody was gong fu, which means develop mastery. Mm. And he said every young person should find something that they love enough to devote themselves to, to develop mastery at something. Because until you learn to master one thing well, you don't know the process of cultivating mastery. And so you just bounce all over like a, a steel ball in a ping pong machine, a pinball machine. And, and I think that it's very important for all the young people listening to realize that focusing and testing things out. I built the entire Czech Institute by studying worldwide literature, traveling the world, studying with the best masters at whatever it was I felt I needed to know to help people. And inevitably, they would have some great ideas, but then they would have things that I'd go test them in the clinic and they just didn't work. And so it was like, you know, we all run the risk of being addicted to our own ideas mm -hmm. and not seeing the limitations of them. So my job was to test everything. And after I tested it clinically, then I could filter out what was really workable from what was just theoretical and teach my students what I could demonstrate hands down worked consistently because it was functional, right? It yeah. was functional. And so I think a lot of the young people need to slow down and put themselves on an information diet. And one of the things mm. I see students doing is rushing from workshop to workshop and seminar to seminar and, and, and plant medicine ceremony to plant medicine ceremony, but they're still the same village idiot they were a year ago, but now they got wasted 60 cups of ayahuasca. <laughs> and so, you know, the, the, the thing is, is I tell people never do another medicine ceremony till you've fully integrated the one you've done and you've taken the lessons you've been given from spirit and you've really looked hard at yourself and then practiced being the person that spirit's guiding you to be for your own unfolding in your own spiritual fulfillment and your own growth and development as a contributor to the world. Mm -hmm. And it's the same with knowledge. And so I tell people, don't take another seminar and don't even take my next course, even though it costs me money. I say, don't come to the next level of training till you eat, sleep, breathe, and shit what I taught you in this one. Because otherwise, what you're going to do is you're going to stack more and more knowledge, which is information until you master it. And you're going to get to the point where you have so much in your head, you can't remember what works, who to use it with, what's true, what's not true. And you just become a, a photocopy machine. And that's not knowledge. Well, I mean, the, the proverb, how can you receive my cup if your cup is already full, right? And so right. you have yes. to empty that cup and, and that's a perpetual process, right? It's not just a one and done. It, it is a continual. And, you know... I would I would follow up what you said with the thing that men need to do is that they need to do. They just need to do we need yes. to do things, right? What do men need to do? They need to do. Um, and that's the only and it really truthfully, and this is what I found as well, with with kind of, you know, my my dabbling initially in this kind of men's development stuff, is it actually doesn't matter what the thing is is you know the the primitive survival skills bushcrafting uh fist fighting all of these very masculine you know traditionally masculine concepts work really well and they appeal to me personally but it, it actually doesn't matter what it is that you're learning it's just that you go through the process of learning and you if you can evaluate how you're learning you then can replicate that and apply it to learning whatever it is. And so for, for me, a, a big part of what I've tried to do is just develop myself as a professional learner. Unfortunately, I yes. have a very thick skull and the only way for me to learn stuff is through the hardest way possible. Like I, you know, the, the, the message comes and I get hit in the face and it's not received. And after about, you know, 10 or 15 kicks, you know, to the to the noggin, I realized, hey, maybe I should like cover that or, or something, you know, that's just my burden to bear. Hopefully other people are a little bit smarter and can learn faster. But, you know, I've just understood, okay, this is the process that I have to go through. I have to bump into things and unfortunately bump into them a lot. But 
if I do that enough, I will gain the experience and I can apply that somewhere, just like what you're talking about. You can mm-hmm. receive all the information you want. If you can't put it to practice, it is utterly useless. And in fact, like you said, you'd be better off never having gotten that extra seminar, that extra bit of knowledge to begin with, because it now it's just compounding um, and complicating matters. Yeah. And also it leads to a lot of insecurity because one part of you thinks you're smart, but then when you have to go apply it, you realize you don't know what you're doing. So you get this sort of double edged, you get a double bind. I can memorize all this information, but I don't really know if it works. Right. And, and I think this is where a lot of men in particular run into trouble because, you know, that, that pride is a tricky thing in that it's useful in some way because if we had no ego, we didn't have enough pride in ourselves, we'd never try anything. We'd never make any attempt because what's the point? Who cares? Yeah. Right. But at the same time, it, it can be so fragile that we can't risk damaging it by, you know, the four letter word of failure, like we, we mentioned right. earlier. And so, again, we have to reframe the way we attempt things, whether it's a, an athletic endeavor, whether it's starting a business, whether it's doing a home project, you know, a renovation, building a deck, whatever it is, you have to accept that, hey, I'm probably going to screw some things up and that's okay. You know, I'm going to learn from that. And, you know, maybe my first the first table I ever build out in my workshop isn't immaculate and isn't this work of art. But you know, if I keep doing it enough, one of these things is going to be really nice. And, you know, if I'm okay with not with delaying that gratification, if not being instantly gratified where the first thing I tried was perfect, then I can learn a skill. I can, I can apply it. And over time, man, I might get really good at some stuff. And then I can impart that knowledge on someone else, which, which I think is really the point of everything is not just to assimilate for ourselves, but it's to gain knowledge and then pass it on to others, whether that be another person that we encounter or ideally to our own children. Going back to this manliness thing, I think that is our job as men is to gain enough knowledge to then teach to our children and impart that wisdom on them and get set them up to have more success than we were able to have ourselves. We pave the way. Exactly. One of the things my son said in his comments that he sees in challenges with men and young men is that they have a hard time balancing researching things on the internet with mm. actually going and doing things. And he, he said, you know, they'll spend hours researching the, the newest game, but then you know, I'm, I'm adding to what he said, but then, but then they forget to take the trash out or, or to, uh, you know, do their chores or, or do the things they need to do. And, um, there's a great book. I don't know if you've been exposed to it all. It's called boys adrift by Leonard Sachs, MD. Mm -hmm. And it it really, it's a real good look at, at what's going on with young men in the world. And he also talks about how, young men are just falling deeper and deeper and deeper in, into, you know, the video game trap, but they're not actually contributing. They're, they're losing their drive in school. Their, their, their grades are going down. Levels of addiction to drugs are going up. Dangerous behavior, driving dangerously. It's almost like they're living the video game out when they're not on the game because they've spent so much time in the video game. You see, if you, if you're a wrestler or a martial artist, you, you spend a fair bit of time in an environment where everybody around you is working on their own level of mastery. And then, and then you go home and you you make some food and you know, there's a process there. You go in your backyard and you work on your garden. There's a process. You build the table you were talking Mm -hmm. about. There's a procedure you've got to go through. But if you, spend so much of your life in a virtual environment that you're not really interfacing with reality, then what happens is you start to actually make the false assumption that the whole world is a video game because that's the environment you've developed yourself to interface with. And that environment is not a real environment. It's a digital environment. You know, as I've got a video I put up, I think you might, I don't know if I shared it with you or not, the danger of living in two realities. Mm Mm-hmm. And so I, I give the example, 
if you've got a tree on your iPhone, that tree doesn't need water. That tree doesn't need to be pruned. That tree doesn't grow fruit that you can eat. That tree really doesn't need anything, and it's being used to capture your attention so people can make money off of it. So if you get to the point where you think the world is full of digital trees and you ignore the real ones, you'll starve to death. And so I think yeah. part of the problem is we've now got multiple generations of digital people that don't spend enough time in the natural environment getting their feet dirty, their hands dirty, mm -hmm. sweating, grunting, getting cut, getting bruised, getting banged up, and, and learning about the, you know, the actual reality of Newtonian classical physics. Right. You know, on a video game, <laughs> Action, you can jump reaction. over a house. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. You you can you you can get away with anything on a video game. There's no consequences to it. You can even treat people rudely on the internet. Yep. But you you know, you can't do that in person because you you say something rude or disrespectful to somebody like you that has the skills to compensate for that behavior, then you know, you'll only do it one time most likely because <laughs> you'll remember it for the rest of your life. But you you can do this indefinitely in a digital world. And and we see exactly how Bill Gates behaves and how Klaus Schwab behaves and Yuval Harari behaves and, and, and how Biden behaves. And they all behave as though there's no consequences for their actions. And ultimately, one day it's going to come bite them in the ass and it's already bit us in the ass. The yeah. question is, how long are we going to keep playing these games? Which means, where are the men mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that are supposed to be defending us against this silliness? I was just going to say to your to your point with with all of that in the digital world is what happens is you 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 develop a lack of sensitivity right yes or your sensitivity gets diverted elsewhere where it's like okay I have this controller and if you watch some of these people play the sensitivity required to move that joystick and push this button and the coordination and the I mean it, it is pretty impressive mm. but to hone that level of sensitivity, you have to forego all the others. And so now we're not sensitive as to, you know, how to do anything else inside, you know, in the actual real world. And I think that becomes the problem. Uh, we only have so much attention and time to dedicate to things. So we have to be very selective as to where we put that energy. And we have to understand, I think a big part for men, where the trappings are um, and understanding that that all of these things are taking advantage, taking advantage of the way the system is designed, right? And and we just have to be aware of that. We have to understand that, you know, just with like diet, refined sugar, as much as good as it tastes to our it's tricking our brain. It's hijacking the system and saying, hey, eat more of this. This is what I need. But truthfully, it is it, you know, it's one of the worst things you can put in your body. But the instant gratification we receive kind of overrides our, our cognitive, you know, ability to discern, Hey, wait a minute, maybe this isn't the best thing. Technology is the same way watching, you know, copious amounts of videos online. I mean, porn is another great example of, of hijacking the system in that it's, it's giving us this, this dopamine response that we have evolved to say dopamine, good, give me more. But that was an evolutionary characteristic that we needed to to survive. Again, it's hijacking this this comfort driver that we have that that was vital to our survival. Now that that survival component is is kind of no longer an issue, most of us aren't going to freeze to death or you know die of dehydration for lack of clean water. We just have to be cognizant of it and understand that that these things are interfering with that, and we have to make sure that we you know, catch ourselves if we start falling into these traps and make the right adjustments and preemptively pursue some of the more, again, primal things. I mean, I hate to overuse that word, primitive, whatever the way that we were kind of created to be, which is delayed gratification, doing things that are harder, not because we have to, but, but you know, because it, it, man, it, it, it's its own reward in of itself. Yeah. So one of the things, there's two things I want to talk about before we move forward uh, with our outline, Josh. One of the things that came up, and it's come up multiple times 
is that several of the guys running men's groups have told me that one of the problems with young guys is they keep trying to be the alpha male, but they're not alphas. Mm. So they're, they're kind of masquerading as alphas and acting in ways that just get them in a lot of trouble. But that never works when you're in the presence of a real alpha male. And so this leads to steroid use. It leads to kind of cocky behavior, pretending like you know more than you do, and things that ultimately um, have a repelling effect. I, mm -hmm. I wanted to bring that up with you because, you know, certainly, you, you know, you, you may, I don't know you well enough to know if you would be considered yourself an alpha male or if you think of yourself as an alpha male. But you, you, we all know when we're in the presence of an alpha male. Like if Kyle Kingsbury is around, nobody's got a question who an alpha male is. <laughs> right. Okay. If when, when you're with Laird Hamilton, I don't care who you are. You're going to know who in that room is the alpha male. I mean, mm -hmm. standing next to Laird is like being next to an oak tree. And he looks at you and he looks right through you. He, he's like, you're talking to a guy that surfs 110 foot waves. You're not dealing with the average dude here. And, you know, I work with alpha males for a living. I mean, the guys that come see me are the best at what they yeah. do, no matter whether it's martial arts, motocross racing, kickboxing, uh, professional football. Kobe Bryant was a client of mine. I worked for hundreds of professional athletes and world-class sports teams, the Chicago, I mean, the list of the teams I've worked for is long. I've, I've been swimming in alpha males my whole life. And so one of the things I wanted to ask you is what's your thought on alpha males? Do you think they're born or do you think they're made? Oh, that's a great question. And I'm going to, I'm going to take a tangent here in by saying that I don't love the concept of, of alpha male, maybe if, if nothing else, but in terminology, simply because you were not really a, a pack animal necessarily. So I, I, I understand what, how people are trying to use it, but it's been so misused by the guys that you're talking about, the guys who think that they are actually at the top of the food chain who really aren't, that it's like, I almost recoil even when I hear that, you know, because generally guys that are espousing that they are like, you know, the old saying, if you have to tell people that you are, you typically are right. And, right, and again, yeah. the kind of people that you deal with, you know, and, and, and I learned this from a lot of the guys who were, you know, really, you know, tier one SF military guys the the notion of a quiet professional where like you don't have to tell people when you are in fact the baddest dude in the room you don't have to tell anyone because they just know it they can sense it they can feel that presence and and so you know anything beyond that is really just posturing and and to to, to people who are accomplished who are you know what most would consider alpha they can smell that a mile away and it is very off-putting. And, and I think we've all been there at some point. I think we've all come through, you know, as young men, we weren't there, but we wanted to be there. So we were going to try and fake it till we make it type, you know, scenario. And I think that that's okay, but it, but that's, you know, a very immature state of being for a man. And if you're in your late thirties, forties, and you're still doing that, man, you might want to take some look a look in the mirror and really reevaluate because you know every everyone knows it that you're not except for maybe you and i think deep down inside that guy probably knows it as well he just doesn't want to admit it so then he doubles down and and, and tries to alpha even harder yeah and you know when and the other thing i would say in that regard is all you got to do is be in the presence of an alpha male and you'll you'll know inside yourself you'll feel the first thing a, a non-alpha will feel is fear and insecurity, especially if there's women around, because right. the women can smell an alpha male and they gravitate toward them like magnets. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the other thing is I've actually looked at a lot of research over my career, and I'll give you an example of a study. And it was investigating the issue of, is, is there such thing as an alpha male? And what they did was they took Navy SEALs. And they surveyed the other SEALs and said, 
who among you, whether it be on your SEAL team, do you consider to be the alpha or the leader? And they mm -hmm. always knew. So then what they did was very interesting. They took groups of five alphas and put them together, and they found every single time they always oriented themselves into an order from number one to number five, just like wolves do. Exactly. Really? No kidding. Yes. And they so found it we did are not matter. Animals. Well, we're, we're social animals. Certainly. I think our brains are, are bigger. So we have abstract thinking and, and that's where the abstract thinking is where the, the faking it comes from. Right. Because you imagine yourself as, but what was very interesting, and they did this with the most elite soldiers, mm -hmm. Navy SEALs, special forces, um, those types. And they found every single time when they would then put them into a, like a mission type task that they would organize themselves without even realizing they were doing it. Right. And so they found that in our nervous system, there is a hierarchical system of structuring order because if you don't have the right order, i.e. the wrong leader, your chances of getting killed go up. Yes. And that's the function of an alpha male. Yeah. I'd be curious to see if that, if that holds true you know, with women as well. If, if they have that same ability and I only bring that they up, did. okay, you know, because, yes, because it's I been think studied for, for men, there is this, you know, inherent ability and drive and, and necessity to prioritize and, and create hierarchy to create structure. Um, you know, I think that the masculine energy is that of organization to some degree versus a feminine energy can often be described as a more of a chaotic creative kind of thing and not in a bad way, but just different, different aspects. And, and so, you know, it could be a product of that, but I think when it comes to like, you know, the, the concept of alpha, it's really important to, to do just like you said, to be able to figure out, okay, who is the best person for this job, especially when our survival right. is on the line and, and, you know, being able to recognize, and I think because these these guys who they put in there were so actualized that, hey, if this guy is a is better with a long range weapon than I am, I don't have to be the sniper of the group. I am happy to let him because I also I know that I have value and my skill set is going to be better served, you know, on a heavy machine gun or or whatever whatever that division of labor is. And I think that that's a I mean. I think that that's the way it should be. The problem is we have too much insecurity where no one is willing to relinquish. And again, it doesn't mean that the sniper guy is more important than the heavy machine gun guy is more important than even the supply guy who doesn't get a lot of credit in the military. They all have their job in a society, you know, as we expand that out to more and more people, we all have our roles to play. It's just that we tend to focus on, you know, the quarterback. And we don't really care about the outside linemen or the defensive end or some of these other less, you know, flashy positions. But that just because that guy, you know, doesn't get all the camera time doesn't mean he isn't just as alpha or as important as someone else. It's just they're different roles. They have a lot of value. The, it's, it, it's the guy in the front that's keeping the quarterback from getting sacked, right? And so he might not be in the limelight. But he's the one making that quarterback successful in many ways. Yeah. Because you can't throw a ball if you're on the ground, right? And, and, yeah. And so this is where I think sometimes the alpha mentality gets a little bit skewed because we say, okay, well, the quarterback is obviously the alpha on the team, right? That's the guy. He's the leader. He's calling the shots. But at that level, when everyone is a you know trained professional at their highest capability, they sh they could and should all be alphas in their own right. It's just that this guy's alpha at throwing the football. This guy is the alpha at blocking and protecting him. And the wide receiver is the alpha at catching it. And when you have that collective team together, man, you're going to win some games. You're going to have some success. And instead of, Hey, I got to be the quarterback and no one else, you know, no one else can be in the spotlight. And, and again, I think this is a scarcity mentality that a lot of men operate from and again, and, and it breeds a lot of this posturing and conflict amongst other successful men.
It does. Yeah. And so a couple of things I want to share, because I've, I've had deep conversations on this with people that are really in the know on it. Um, I did a podcast on driven people with Doug, Doug Brockman and Megan, his assistant, which was very good. And we talked about Alpha in there. And then I also interviewed Sasha Armstrong. The podcast is called The Dog Shaman. She actually lived with the wolves, I think, for multiple years. Oh, that's cool. And, and she studied wolves very deeply and in, in, in personal contact in, in the wild. And she took her studies of wolves and then looked at human beings. And she and I talked quite a lot about the nature of an alpha. But what she brought up and what I've seen other experts say, and this is an important point, is that the alpha isn't always the best at everything. And quite often they're not. Mm -hmm. In other words, just because you're the best sniper you might be the best sniper, so you're the alpha sniper, but on the team, you may not be the alpha. But what she showed was, and what she learned from the wolves, is that the alphas are the ones that have the best overall sense of what's going on and the best natural leadership skills and the best ability to organize the team mm. so that each alpha at what they do is in the right place at the right time. Yeah, Does that I mean, makes that, sense. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And I think, you know, again, we 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 put the emphasis on who is the best at a particular skill, not looking at a more holistic approach. You know, and it, we do need specialists in the world, right? It's, yes. I'm not saying that everyone should be, you know, just a jack of all trades, and no one should really ever specialize in one thing. But I think we've also fall into this pattern of specialization to the exclusion of all else, which I think is also, you know, not incredibly useful. So, you know, part of, part of this idea of bringing it back to, to Savage Gentleman a little bit is, is finding a balance and, and being a jack of all trade. And yeah, maybe you have an area where you are more versed than others, but it doesn't mean you just neglect everything else in your life. Right. And I think uh, this is another path that a lot of a trap that guys fall into. They pick a career and that's it. They, they become that career. They are that job. They are that title, whatever that is. And nothing else exists beyond that. And yeah, you got really good at that one thing. And maybe you're making a ton of money and maybe you're the best in the world at, at this. But that's, that's a very narrow, um, cylinder right yeah which is easy to topple over right for me yeah. i think more of in, in in shapes of a pyramid where it's a really wide base right where i've got a breadth a, a wide breadth of knowledge and then i can build on top of that and of course it's going to narrow as we go up but i'm not you know i'm not a toothpick that you know an antenna that's sticking you know 50 feet up in the air right i've got to got to have a strong foundation i think that is is at least for the most part in, in our modern age, the direction we should be trending towards, you know, as opposed to the other way where everyone is just a specialist and they only know their one thing. And now you, you're, you're just a cog in the wheel, you know, instead of being yes. a multifaceted individual, it's like, okay, you have your one job, you assemble this one part in the assembly line and that's it. You put this one screw in. I don't think we're meant to exist in that way. Yes. It's, it's maybe optimized for industry, you know, yeah. but we're not, we're not, we're not ants in a colony. We're not, you know, we're not automatons that are, you know, despite what some of our, our betters and I use quote might believe about the rest of us peasants. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're not just here to, to serve and, and punch a clock and do our little job. You know, I, I think we're, created to be much more than that. And a lot of people, I think, have just forgotten it or have been tricked and duped into believing otherwise. Hi, everybody. Did you know that Symbiotica now has a new excellent plant-based protein for you? Symbiotica's plant-based protein is a scientifically backed protein powder that fuels your body with essential vitamins and minerals, whole food nutrients, and a full range of amino acids. It features three complete proteins, raw greens, fiber, pre- and probiotics, digestive enzymes, and adaptogenic mushrooms. 
Crafted with the highest quality of organic ingredients, Symbiotica's plant-based protein is made for all lifestyles and is trusted and used by the world's top athletes. This product is ideal for those living a vegan or vegetarian lifestyle or people like me that like to give their body a rest from flesh foods and detox once in a while while being able to still get enough protein to meet your needs even if you're athletic. For those of you wanting to deepen your meditation, enhance your subtle energy perception and voyances such as clairvoyance, try taking two to three weeks off of flesh foods and use Symbiotica's plant-based protein supplement, drink lots of clean water, sauna regularly, avoid recreational drugs, and you'll be amazed at what happens. You'll feel like you've been super tuned to great spirit in the cosmos and your body will love you too. Symbiotica's plant-based protein boosts energy and recovery, promotes gut health, and offers you 20 grams of protein per scoop. To get your Symbiotica plant-based protein, go to bit.ly forward slash Symbiotica L number 4 D. That's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash Symbiotica L-4-D. To get your discount, use the promo code L-4-D-15 for 15% off. That may be case sensitive, so make it all caps. That's capital L, number 4, capital D-15 for 15 off Symbiotica's excellent plant-based protein powder. What I want to put on the table that's important, and like I say, I've spent my life working with alpha males, and my father is quite an alpha male. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think one, I would like to say, if you're in the presence of another male or other males, and you find yourself feeling insecure, and your ego reacts by trying to draw attention to yourself or you find yourself in your head finding judgments about how to break that guy down so you can feel better about yourself, that's your first indication that you need to pay close attention to that person. Because what you want to do is say, what is it about that person that's making me insecure about myself? And then I have to project my shadow onto that person to make myself look and feel better than I really am when the opportunity there is to say, okay, if I'm in the presence of a real alpha male, see, for example, when Laird's working with me, he's very interested in what I have to teach him. So there is no alpha male attitude whatsoever because he knows that I am very knowledgeable or he wouldn't be paying me a very large sum of money. I'm not a cheap date at all. (laughs) And so he, He is paying attention. He's come to me with a specific problem and wants specific help. And he doesn't sit there and argue with me. Now, I've had many athletes and I've literally had to look them in the eye. I won't name names because I don't want to, to do that. But there's been many cases where I've had athletes getting all cocky, treating me like I'm a bag man or something. And I look them right in the eyes and say, listen. There's a reason your team is paying a shitload of money to fly me in here to help you. And the reason is because nobody here knows what to do with you. And I'm going to let you know right now, you put your pants on the same way that I do. And you've got a choice right now. Either listen to me, pay attention, and do what I teach you and get better so you can go off and make your millions or your career is on the line. So this is your last warning. Either pay attention and put away the bullshit Mm -hmm. or I'm going to walk out of here and it's over. And I've never had to say that twice. (laughs) Now, the other thing is, is that when, when we're in the presence of somebody that for whatever we're doing, certainly there's guys in, in, in uh, jujitsu or there's guys in, wrestling or there's guys, you know, in auto racing. I mean, I, I was a stock car racer. I knew who the alpha male was. That's the guy I'm trying to beat all the time. Yeah. That's the guy I'm studying the most, Mm -hmm. you know, everywhere I go. I, when I used to work in logging camps, I knew who the best fallers were. That's the guys I studied, but I didn't go around telling rumors about him and saying, oh, the, he's not that good and shit like that. That was stupid. One, one rumor like that gets back to the alpha and you're, 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 you're pushed to the side because you're a pain in the ass already. 
And that kind of dynamics ruins a team. Yeah. So the point I'm making for the young guys is when you feel yourself feeling threatened, nervous, insecure, that's not when you start manufacturing stories or puffing up your traps or puffing your chest out or talking shit. That's when you should hold real still and pay very close attention because there's a reason your instincts are telling you that you're in the presence of power. Mm -hmm. You're in the presence of wisdom. You're in the presence of capability, of agency. And to, to lend a little perspective on that, because I think for a lot of guys, it does make them uncomfortable. And, and so they, you see it a lot. They, they want to remove themselves from that situation, right? They want to leave the room or like you mentioned, they want to undermine that guy so that they can feel better. And, and I would just, just challenge any of the younger guys. If you find yourself in that, be grateful, right? You should have gratitude that you were in a space where there is someone, however good you are, you might be awesome at a thing, but you have just found yourself in the presence of, and in, in a room where someone is better at it. You just hit the lottery. Be excited, be happy, and and be joyous that you get to learn from someone who has that experience because that's only going to help you. As opposed to, okay, I you know what? If I can't, you know, if I can't have the biggest dick in the room, I don't want to be in the room. You know, you have a lot of guys that that feel that way. And it's like, man, that is a huge missed opportunity. If you can step away from your ego a little bit, you could learn something and you know, someday you might be that guy. In the room. If, I, if, I always tell those guys, look, if you're worried about the size of your dick, all you got to do is learn to breathe through your ears and lick your eyebrows and you got it made. <laughs> problem solved, right? I mean, problem just, solved. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. But yeah, you see it a lot. I mean, you know, I've seen that kind of posturing. And, and this is the other thing that I would challenge too, is like, man, if you find yourself in that realm, then where you're uncomfortable, right? If you're not finding yourself being surrounded by people that are better than you, then you need to find a different room. If you're, if you're always the Amen. baddest, if you're the baddest dude in every room you walk into, you're walking into the wrong rooms, in my opinion. Amen. That, um, that, that's one of the, that's probably one of the most important tips today. You know, I, I'm, I've developed my level of skill by finding the guys and the women in the world that had a lot more knowledge than me. Mm -hmm. And that's why I pay them. And that's why they're interesting to me. And that's what makes, you know, there's an old saying, before you can become a good leader, you must become a good follower. And there's yep. a lot of truth to that, you know, and, and a lot of young people today don't want to do the work to develop the mastery but they want the instant gratification of the leader or the best. And so they put up this smoke screen, but then when the rubber hits the road, they don't have this, the stuff. Yeah. Right. And then the so, house of so cards falls. And so you go from job to job, you're, you, you go from relationship to relationship and it's always poor me, the victim, the, the you know, the, the story. And I'm like, that right there is because you got a video game mentality. Right. You got to get down to earth and do the work of mastery. That was the point I was going to make is no one has taught them to actually learn the process of becoming right. For whatever reason, yeah. they never, never learned that lesson. Maybe it was taught to them. They just didn't receive it. Or maybe there was there wasn't someone in their life to actually show them that. And this is something that I see a lot in the, the men's space. You know. It's really easy to get online and see someone doing something and then criticize the way that they're doing. Oh, this guy doesn't know how to use a chainsaw or you know, whatever it is. Uh, pick, pick an activity. I mean, the firearms industry is probably one of the most brutal. If you go in the, the comment section on there, every single guy on the internet is an absolute expert with a firearm. And he can tell you every single thing that that person in the video is doing wrong. Now they can't do the stuff themselves, certainly, but they know and they can point out every single flaw. And, you know, this is part of the problem where it's easy to sit back and critique, but my, my philosophy is that either you're part of the solution or you're part of the problem. And if all you're doing is pointing the holes and everyone else, that's part of the problem. If you have this, you know, amazing knowledge and capability, 
why aren't you sharing it with other people? You know, instead of just critiquing everyone online, when's the last time you, you know, you want to pick on hipsters because they don't know how to change a tire or whatever. When's the last time you showed, you helped a hipster change his tire, you know, or, or whatever, yes. right? That's, mm -hmm. that needs to be, I think, you know, the, again, the doing, right? If you have the knowledge, you have to teach it and share it. And if you don't, you can't look around the world and say, man, this place sucks. All these guys are pussies and, you know, whatever you want a disparaging thing you want to say about kids today. And it's like, who have you imparted wisdom on? Who have you mentored? Who have you taught? No one? You're part of the problem. Yes. One of the one of the who I feel to be one of the best psychologists in the world. He's an uh, an integral psychologist, Keith Witt. I've had a couple of great podcasts with him, and I have studied a lot of his work. And he is a, just a real deep dude. He's a black belt in I can't remember which style of karate. He's seventy five now, but he's still in great shape. He's very very sharp. But he he says something that's very relevant to what you're saying. He said, look. There's either drama or solutions, mm. and that's always our choice, more drama or solutions. And I think a lot of young people get caught in the drama and don't invest in the solution. And I think if you don't, the world doesn't need more drama, right? TV, social media, most of it's just a bunch of bullshit. It's drama. When you're in a real relationship, like, you know, you, you're married, you've got kids. When you're in a relationship, there's always going to be challenges. It's called the work of love. Whenever you're in a relationship challenge, you've got a choice. Do I keep dramatizing or do we try to find a solution here? Yep. And if you keep dramatizing, what happens is you grow further and further apart. And the next thing you know, you're sleeping with your backs together. And then if that keeps going on, someone's going to start having an affair. And mm -hmm. then your kid's life's going to get screwed up. Yep. And all that was because you were more invested in drama than solutions. Well, drama is easy. It doesn't easy. take any brains. It, it takes nothing. It takes nothing, right? There's no effort involved. You just, you know, take this surface level thing and you run with it, right? Solutions are difficult. And, and you know, bringing it back to, to diet, it's like, well, you know, it's hard to go out and, and shoot an elk and process that meat and carry it home and cook that for dinner. You know, it's easy to drive through the McDonald's fast food line and get a Big Mac. Both are food. And poison yourself. <laughs> Both are food, technically, and I use that to, that term, you know, uh, loosely. Carefully. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you can put both in your mouth, but one of them is going to do better for the overall system. But it is a well, lot one of them's, harder. One of them's man's food mm -hmm. and one of them's fast food. There you go. One of them you one of them you worked for, mm -hmm. the other one you didn't work for. Yeah. And we can apply that formula to pretty much anything that we're doing. And and for the most part, we live in an economy of of cheap and easy. And so you can elect to buy into that and participate in it. You know, and, and I'm not saying we have to shun all technology. I'm not saying that you have to delete your Amazon account. Um because you know that is that is easy free delivery you got to love that uh next day it's amazing but at the same time it's like well you're feeding this this side of things you're going to you, you know you get you get what you pay for right versus hey yeah. if we do things a little bit more challenging maybe they take a little bit longer but we're more intentional about them you're going to have better results overall the gratification may be delayed but the benefit is going to be far and above. And I think that is something that, that as a society, we need to, man, try and just kind of reconfigure our brains. Again, we're bombarded with all of this cheap, easy solutions for everything. And not to say that we have to go back to a horse and buggy. I'm not, I'm not a Luddite, you know, and just, Hey, we got to live in the dark ages, but man, there is value in doing things a little bit more intentionally, a little bit slower. Um, you know, fast is not always better. More is not always better. No, no. And, and that's for sure. Uh, 
what, I'll just claim for the women listening, when I said elk is men, men's food, I meant that as a metaphor, uh, because there are women that are great hunters, mm -hmm. there are women that are great soldiers, there's mm -hmm. women that are great fighter pilots, there's women that are great, my, my wife, I got two wives, they're better than me at almost everything, that's why I have them close, Yep. and uh, um, my, my friend Monsal Denton, who I've got a great podcast on sacred hunting with, has he talks about the women and he, he says that he's trained some work with and trained some amazing female hunters. So um, I, I don't want to be stereotypical in saying it's man's food. I'm using it more as a metaphorical. Mm -hmm. I meant you have to work for it. You have to do the work of the hunt and the processing and the carrying and it's hard work. We were talking about one of the things that pretty much all the guys running men's group that I've worked with and talked to say is that there's just, and I know this for a fact, and Leonard Sachs talks about it a lot in his Boys Adrift book, and that's the porn addiction. And I've always been really interested in, in what's driving this thing. You know, uh, fortunately for me, I've, I'm, I'm so in love with the real thing. Porn to me is always like a shadow <laughs> of the real thing. It's like, it's like reality TV. Why would I want to watch people race motorcycles or, swim in rivers or whatever i'll just go do it i'm not i'm not you know yeah. i always tell people life is life is a participation sport it's not a spectator <laughs> sport but one of the guys who, who i have deep respect for i've studied quite a bit of his work and he's a genius his name is mark gaffney he he has a, a great audio book called the erotic and the hole and he's written several other books if you search mark m-a-r-c-g-a-f-n-i mm -hmm. on amazon he's been involved in Ken Wilber's think tanks for years. He's a super, super genius guy. And so I, I, in, in my podcast that I did with him, talked about this, and he talks about this in his book, The Erotic and the Holy. And I reached out to him as part of the people I consulted for this podcast. And I said to him, Mark, you, you talked about the, the, the actual etiology, what's causing all the porn addiction. And he uh, reiterated what he shared in the erotic and the holy and some of his other areas. And I wanted to bring it up here because it's such a big, important aspect of this lost young men issue. And he, he, he talks about the fact that Eros love and, and er in the Greek conception, Eros is the masculine form of love. It's outgoing. Agape is the feminine love Agape holds the family together. It's nourishing, nurturing. Eros is, is like the love of the hunt, the love of winning the sport, the, the love of getting that next woman, you know, the, the challenge of it. His approach to Eros is actually inverted to the Greeks in many ways, but it's still very deep and it comes from the Hebrew culture. He's actually a, a rabbi, a Jewish okay. rabbi. And so... But he describes Eros as that which penetrates and always looks for novelty, new experiences, and wants to grow itself to become more. And so he describes the porn addiction as false Eros or pseudo Eros because the, the, the person can never penetrate. They can't engage. They can't grow into and grow with. You see, sex is typically part of a relationship experience, and sex is a bonding force that helps give you the deep connection needed to do the real work of love in relationship. So when you're masturbating to porn, you're not actually penetrating into the novelty. You know, no matter how many times you have sex with a woman, it's never the same twice unless right. you've become a robot. And if you if you have sex with multiple women, it's never the same twice. Even twin sisters, you're not going to get the same experience. So you see, Eros penetrates because it is the love of God, and God is a novelty generator. God wants new experiences so that it can experience itself. Yep. So whenever we engage experiences like porn, we can't penetrate the novel. We can't have a new experience. And so what happens is we have this emptiness inside of us 
So you get all this ejaculation, but there's actually no real heartfelt or psychological fulfillment. So it's almost like something, it's like, it would be like having a cup that you could never fill up. So you pour your tea and the whole picture's in there and you look and there's nothing in there. And you're like, yeah, it just where'd my never tea ends. go? Mm -hmm. It never ends. So yeah. what happens is you keep engaging this and, you know, a man's body invests all its resources into making sperm. And, and all of us males that have been fortunate enough to have lots of sex or that have masturbated ourselves into submission especially when you're a martial artist or someone who's really got a way to measure their athletic performance, mm -hmm. you can put, you know, I, I can have enough sex to make myself weak in the gym for about five days compared oh, yeah. to what I normally And do. I can have enough gym to make myself weak in the sex too, if I'm not careful. Yes, it exactly. goes both ways. Go, yes, absolutely. So, so, so we come to something critical, which I'm going to bring up again later. What is your dream goal or objective? And what are the values that mm. you use to guide your, what's your inner compass so you know when five orgasms with the best looking girl in town is actually not a good idea because you're in a jujitsu tournament <laughs> in two days. Yeah. Or you're going to be racing your motorcycle tomorrow. Yep. Or you've got a house to build and you're putting the foundation in or, you know, you, you have to have a sense of direction. Or what happens is you just become a pleasure seeking moron that never gets anything done and you're proud of your empty nuts. And that's all you got is empty, an empty cup. Yep. And there's nothing more to it. And so I, I just wanted to bring the concept on the table that, that real arrows penetrates to gain novel experiences to grow itself. And sex in a relationship is to give you the bonding and the euphoria of intimacy so that when challenges come, there's enough bond that you don't just give up. You remember the experience of the love and the connection to that person. You're aware that they're inside of you, that they're part of you, and that you love them, not just because they got a nice ass or they're, <laughs> they taste good or they got the perfect boobies or whatever your fantasy is, but that there's work to do. There's life to live and there's shadows to work through and there's intelligence to be gained from each other. And you don't get that from porn. You no. get an illusion. You get an illusion, an empty cup. It's a simulacron, right? It's not the real thing. And, you know, essentially what you've done is you've taken the sacred and you've made it profane. Right. Yes. Because you have eliminated exactly the words Mark Gaffney uses, by okay. the way. Okay. He must be a really smart guy. <laughs> he, he is. Trust me. Listen, when my podcast comes out with him, listen, you're, you're going to be at a whole new level of smart. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I and I'm, I'm sure he can he speak far more eloquently than I can on the matter. But, you know, if you look at the act of copulation, right, of, of having sex, it is arguably one of the most beautiful things we can do as humans, second only to creating life and giving birth, which is one follows the other, right? I mean, this is, yes. this is, and then this is holds true for almost any species of life that we know of. Its job is to procreate and reproduce, right? We are, we are creation machines, both in a literal and figurative figurative sense. And I think that stems from our creator, right? Who made everything has embodied that within us to some degree. And so we have that capability and arguably a, a duty to create. And it's not always, it doesn't have to just be having children. You know, there's art, there's all these other things that we can put that energy towards. But I think the highest expression of that is, you know, is, is, is procreation. And so when you, when you take this, this sacred thing um, and you substitute it and you have no fulfilling ability with it, right? There's no ability to be fulfilled in, you know, what you said, because it lacks the penetration, the arrows that you mentioned. There's You're no obligation always, either. And there's, there's nothing to, there's no substance. Again, it comes back to substance. There's nothing to it. Again, we live in this cotton. It's, it's, it's cotton candy. It's just the only thing it's going to do for you is rot your teeth. 
There is no inherent value in it, um, but it hijacks the system. It, it tells the brain, oh, hey, we like this because it, it, is, it is close enough to trick us into believing it's the thing, but it's not the thing. And that's where we have to have the, the discipline and the understanding to recognize, oh, wait a minute, this, you know, yeah, I might feel some somewhat drawn to this, right? And again, if I'm immature and I'm a child, like my kids love cotton candy. They don't, they love co- candy, cookie, all of these things. They know that it's a treat and they're not going to get it all the time. But man, if you were to ask them, hey, would you like a piece of candy at any moment of the day? They're going to say, yeah, duh, I'm a child, right? But yeah. as men, we're no longer children, right? We no longer should, we, we should have the ability to <laughs> understand the difference of what's good for us and what isn't, what's useful, what isn't useful. And I think, you know, when we, when we fail to recognize that, whether it's within love or sex and relationships, whether it's our food or diet, whether it's our exercise or career, wherever that is, if we fail to recognize what is good for us and what isn't, we run into problems and and to really truly understand what benefits us and what doesn't, we have to understand ourselves. And so it, it all comes back to this, you know, kind of through experience, learning who we are and developing and cultivating that. And then we can start to apply that, you know, in our actions in the world around us. But without that, when all you do is sit in a virtual world, right, you have your Oculus headset on and you're just you know, playing the games on a screen beamed in directly into your eyeballs, or you spend it in this device that's sitting in front of you, you, you can't co- comprehend what is actually out there in the real world. And so you can't properly interact with it in any meaningful way. Yeah. So I'm going to make a distinction here, which will lead to my next question. Okay. A man can distinguish false arrows or the empty from real arrows and a man a man won't spend time investing in false arrows because it is actually investing in something that is a shell a shadow it's not real and uh, 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 someone who's not a man yet will sit there and masturbate to porn until the cows come home and their whole life will be a mirror of that behavior pattern And so I think I'm going to make the first distinction of a man. A man is capable of distinguishing that which is real and necessary, useful, and helps experience grow and become. And somebody who's not a man yet cannot make that distinction and gets trapped in blind alleys and addictions and sideshows and typically has the same value judgment problem in multiple areas of their yeah. life. And my observation of working with thousands of young men, the pattern repeats. Yes, it does. Hi everybody. I'm super excited to tell you about Organifi gold chocolate, something that is very tasty and that my kids love. Organifi gold chocolate is a superfood hot chocolate, healthy enough to drink every day. In fact, multiple times a day, if you want. In fact, unlike most chocolate drinks that stimulate you and may disrupt your sleep if consumed after about four in the afternoon, my kids drink it right before bed, and unlike chocolate in general, it actually helps them sleep. Organifi Gold Chocolate doesn't include blood sugar spiking ingredients like other hot chocolate alternatives, leaving you feeling good about indulging in this healthy chocolate beverage. It was formulated to deliver the same amazing benefits as Organifi Gold. Some of the key benefits of Organifi Chocolate Gold, or gold chocolate, is that it has 10 superfoods for rest and relaxation. 100% USD organic certified, tastes delicious in warm water and amazing with milk or milk alternatives, promotes and supports relaxation so you can fall asleep with ease, supports a better night's rest so you wake up refreshed, and promotes a healthier response to stress and gives calming support. As you know, what most people reach for when they want something super tasty and enjoyable is generally not healthy, but that's not the case with Organifi Gold Chocolate, which is USDA certified organic, certified gluten-free, and certified glyphosate residue-free, which is very important, dairy-free, which is great for guys like me, soya-free, which is very important, vegan, non-GMO, 
and clinically proven ingredients, 100% organic whole food, which means it's great for everyone. Save 20% on your purchase of Organifi Gold Chocolate by using the code capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 20. That's check 20 on checkout. Go to Organifi.com, O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com forward slash check 20. And again, for your 20% Living 40 discount, use the code check 20 in all caps. Enjoy Organifi Gold Chocolate. My, my next question is, in your opinion, what does it mean to be a man. I mean, how, how can you categorize a man versus a boy? Yeah. I mean, to me, a man is the, the physical embodiment of masculine energy, right? And then we look at what is masculine energy. And I mentioned a little bit before this concept of creating order, right? Organizing thing when we, you know, to bring it back, you know, from a biblical perspective, whether you subscribe to that or not, I think that there's still a lot of good, good information there. You know, the, the first man who was put on the planet, Adam, was tasked with doing what? Organizing, categorizing, naming all of the things. And we know how powerful the spoken word is and language mm-hmm. is because, you know, again, biblically, everything was created with the word right? Yes. The spirit of God spoke and everything existed. So part of that, I think, has been given to us as men um, and, and humans who, who live on this planet. And so part of that is that, that organization, right? And being able to take disorder and organize it in some uh, useful way. I think that that's a big part of it. So that masculine energy manifests in that way. And again, if you look at the male of almost every species, on planet Earth, of every living creature, it is it has developed and has been designed to do two things: to procreate and to protect or defend that which it has created. Right, and again, yes. you know, yep. a very you know crass way to put this, and I apologize for some of your more delicate sensibility listeners, but it, it cover your ears, down. kids. What's that? Yeah, cover, cover your, your ears, ears kids. Yeah, yeah, but I kids. mean. <laughs> Fighting and fucking. That's yeah. that's what I'm you know, I mean, again, that's a very oversimplified thing, but the 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 male of the species has to have some capability of doing both of those things to be successful and for you know the society, the the species to continue. I tell my students, well, we'll get into this in a minute, but I'll 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 keep it short. I say, look, if you don't if you haven't identified what's worth living for, then you will never know what's worth fighting for. Yeah. And that's a fact. If you, yeah. if you haven't got a clear distinction, like if, if, you're, if you're not living for your own children and for your own family and for your own sovereignty, then you don't know what, what's worth fighting for. And, and, and later we'll come into this because I'm going to share a model. So I don't want to jump ahead, but sure. I think I, I tell people any philosophy worth living is worth challenging. So if, if someone's a, a Christian, I say challenge that philosophy deeply every day to make sure that you're not caught in a belief system that's limiting your growth or your potential to see more of God. If you're a vegan, challenge that philosophy every day. To make sure you're not losing more muscle mass and and becoming malnourished and end up with a disease because I've seen it happen 150 times. Yep. In other words, it's important for all of us to challenge our belief systems and to get clear on what is important to us because without it, we can't truly live. And Someone who's a man has to have made that distinction because, as you said, it's the men that have to protect that which is sacred. Mm-hmm. Life is sacred. Children are sacred. The tribe itself is sacred because tribes weren't in the habit of carrying useless people because then you ruin the tribe. Yep. That's why a rite of passage ceremony in many tribal cultures, if a young man did not pass a rite of passage ceremony, they killed him. They're out. I because mean, because they, they hadn't. They're, you're they either dead kill weight. you or they turn you off into the woods. You, they mm-hmm. can't carry. 
They can't carry more children because someone has to hunt and do the work to feed them. So if you aren't becoming a contributing member of the tribe, you're actually a threat to the survival of the tribe. And Joseph Campbell talks at length about this in his lectures and how many tribes would actually just have to execute the kids that didn't make it through because they simply could not survive carrying big boys and big yeah. babies. Yeah. And so I think that's a, a, a key distinction for a man. If, if you don't know what you're living for, you don't know what to fight for. And if you don't know what you're living for, you won't have the inspiration to build yourself up, to have the inner confidence to face challenges or even face evil when it's in your presence. And I think we're all there right now. Yeah. And that is the fight. You know, I think sometimes people take, you know, when you say fighting and they take it very literal and they, they think of a boxer in a ring or, a, you know, an MMA uh, fighter in a cage. But, you know, to fight is to just exist. Like our our survival is is <laughs> is dependent on us having enough resilience to withstand the elements in the world around us. Because if you do nothing, if you are not strong enough or, or capable enough, you're going to die. die. You will freeze to death. You will starve to death. You will, you're, you're going to perish. Right. So I'm not saying that you have to like, just go out and start punching people in the face, but this, this fight is, you know, we're, we're moving towards a constant state. This body that we live in is, you know, again law of thermodynamics we're moving towards entropy right it's it's slowly decaying as we go if we do nothing we will cease to exist so we have to fight and 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 you know have effort to some degree to continue and i think that's a that's a good thing people tend to shy away from that but otherwise what is the point again do you i don't i don't see any reason for being here on this planet for this, you know, consciousness to enter in this body to just be a, be an observer, right. To be a spectator, right. It well, just, you don't it, even need me, a body to do that. <laughs> no, you, you, you wouldn't, right. You wouldn't, but, but we are given this body and I don't know what, you know, what happens in the next phase and where we go from here. I can either confirm or deny, but what I do know is while we're here, man, but there's some stuff to do and we should be making the most out of it and getting, you know, and, and relishing in the hardships. The fact that we have challenges to meet and to face means that, Hey, guess what? We're still exist. We, we're still here, you know? And that's, to me, that's the whole point of it. To me, the application of the word fight means to stand up for, to protect Mm -hmm. to defend. That can be done through legal channels. It can be done by just stating your opinion. It can be done by saying, this is my limit, no more. You know, there's a lot of ways. Fight doesn't always mean violence. It means, it can mean negotiation. It can mean better communication. It can mean clarifying boundaries. It can mean clarifying values. It can mean getting clear on what the other person's intentions are what their motives are and whether or not that is actually going to be the best for everybody involved or whether that's a threat to everybody involved, because a lot of the people you got to defend don't have enough depth to realize that what they're doing, even if they succeed is actually a threat to their own existence. Like if we let the world economic forum Uh. win this fight, they're actually signing their own death warrant. They just don't know it. They don't realize. They, yeah. They think they're just going to upload themselves into a cloud somewhere <laughs> and live as an information field, but they don't understand that they're very, very naive on way too many levels for me to even, I could do 50 podcasts on yeah. the silly. Well, it takes that real is. humans. It takes real bodies and living beings to maintain and, you know, manage those systems. And so, hey, if you kill off all the humans, sure, you downloaded your your essence to wherever you downloaded it, but without someone to keep the machines up and running, it all falls apart and the plug gets pulled and, you know, it's gone. And I, it's just, it's a very short sighted solution. I, I, we're running down a rabbit hole here. I apologize, but yeah, I agree with no, you. No, no, that's okay. You know, what, what came to my mind that I want to share to, to really kind of put a, a seal on this concept of fight. I can tell you the name of a badass fighter that never hurt anybody. His name was Mahatma Gandhi. He took on the entire British military 
with nonviolence and beat them and got the entire country of India back. And he taught his people how to do it through nonviolent means. And that, to me, is a badass fighter. He didn't have to hurt anybody in order to accomplish the objective of protecting the rights of his people. Yeah. And I think there's a lot to learn from studying people like Mahatma Gandhi and, and many others like that. So I think part of becoming an adult is realizing fighting is extremely dangerous. I've seen a lot of idiots get the hell beat out of them in bars and, and just being stupid, even in boxing rings, that thought they were a lot better than they were and a lot tougher than they were and found out the hard way when their teeth are laying on the ground and they're unconscious that they weren't very smart about <laughs> yeah. their approach. And so I think young men need to understand what it means to fight in ways that have the most likelihood of an outcome that's best for everybody and the least likelihood of anybody getting hurt. Yeah. Because if you get if you get yourself wounded trying to protect something that's meaningful to you, you can't protect it anymore if you're too wounded. So there's there's got to be a level of intelligence, and that's why martial arts is called arts. Yes. It's not called martial death. It's not called martial be an idiot. It's called an art because there is an art to it. And Kung Fu was invented as a defensive art by the monks who kept getting all their food stolen and getting beat up and taken over by bandits. But because they had a spiritual practice, they didn't want to hurt people anymore. So they developed Kung Fu to disable people just enough to protect themselves, but not do any unnecessary damage. That's real fighting. Mm -hmm. Well, if we look at the opposite of fighting, right, would be to surrender, to quit, to give up. And, you know, and, and I think again, if you're a man, you inherently know that that's wrong and that's the the not the course that you want to take. Kids will quit. Kids will give up. You know, a, a young yeah. boy, you know, man, I can't win this game. Why try? And so I think that's a distinction as well is is when you become a man, you you know what's worth fighting for and you you know how to fight and you don't just give up or quit when something becomes hard. And I think for a lot of men seeking that path and, and trying to figure out how to cultivate that within themselves Martial arts is a great way to go because it is such a powerful analogy, right? Now, yeah. yes, you're learning a skill and yes, that skill can be applied in a literal situation to defend yourself, but there's so many parallels between, you know, I'm sure your experience, what you've learned from fighting and then how you deal with your everyday life. I have had to fight in my marriage with my wife. Now we're not coming blows, right? Yeah. But we have to have this uncomfortable situation and we have to resolve it because if she quits or if I quit, like you said, eventually it's a matter of time before we're sleeping back to back. I'm sleeping on the couch and then she's sleeping somewhere else, you know, and like you said, it's the kids who ultimately pay that price and the damage that's done there. I have, I have now <sighs> derelicted my duty as a father, right? to have to cohesively hold this all together and keep and, and and protect the most valuable thing that I have, which was my kids. And again, this isn't to to beat up on anyone who's gone who's separated and gone through some of these things, but anyone who has has to admit that wasn't the ideal path. Right. That was not yes. the best thing for their kids. And you have to do what you have to do. There's abusive relationships. You know, we get in with people that we probably never should have. People change I'm not saying that divorce is, is evil and no one should ever do it, but man, we've got to be really judicious and that should be the absolute last option in my opinion. Well, a rite of passage ceremony hmm. is specifically designed to take you as close to death as possible without killing you and maiming you so that you're not useful to the tribe because what you've got to do to become an adult in a tribe is you've got to be willing to give yourself up for the greater good. Which means if you have to die in a war to protect your tribe, then you do it. Yeah. You've got to be willing to do it. And, and so I, I think a great example of a, a, a great initiatory experience is to do a real firewalk. And, and later we're going to talk about some of these things. But 
I've done a fire walk, a real one, and you really have to get your mind right. And I lot, I watched a lot of people get scared and lose their mindset and get burnt. In fact, the ambulances were very busy. <laughs> and so, you know, you, it, I think we have gotten so comfortable, as you were talking about earlier, with instant gratification and air-conditioned buildings and, you know, curb-to-curb -curb service and uh, airdropped uh, mail from Amazon that we forget that that's not really the nature of life. No. And, and when the power goes out, none of that stuff's there. So where are you going to get your food and water then? Right. So yeah, I, th I think all of these things are very important, but the point of a rite of passage is to go beyond yourself mm -hmm. to learn how to face death and give yourself in service, not, with the intention to want to die, of course not, but the intention to realize that you cannot become a man until you can sacrifice your own existence for that which is more important than you. And your children and your tribe are more important than you. Yeah. And I think this holds true for men in particular, because, you know, in a, in a tribal society, compared to the women, the men are expendable, right? You don't yes, need that are. many, you don't need that many men, you know, to continue on. Right. No. But if you had a lot of men and one woman, you're, you're you screwed. can grow the you're, tribe. You're gone. Right. You're goners. And so I think inherently, well, we, we recognize I mean, if you had a lot of men and no women, you, you can't grow the tribe. Well, you, you definitely can't. Men, grow, but, but even if you only have, if you one, have a you, lot of women and one men, you could grow the tribe fast. But yes. The point is, I agree. Women are more essential to the survival of yeah. the race than men are. And, you know, the, the willingness, I think, to sacrifice for women it, it expresses differently than it does in men. And this is where I think society, we, we, we run into some issues where the woman sacrifices her body to bear a child. Birth. Right. That yes. Is, giving birth is is her inherent sacrifice. Um, for it's men, her right of passage. And, and, and the rite of passage for men. It's it's a little bit harder to define. And I think what you're talking about is going through this thing where you, you know, push yourself as close to death without, you know, disfiguring, maiming or, or destroying yourself is really important to know that you have that within you that it, when and if the time comes, you can also make that sacrifice for the tribe, for the greater good, for your family, your kids. And, you know, in today's day and age, we have very few opportunities. We have no established um, places for that. And even even outside of of what society deems, you know, most of the rites of passage that we would go through were kind of very fringe and, and, and almost underground nowadays. The problem is, is, you know, I have the knowledge to put a hell of a good rite of passage ceremony together, but the legal complications oh, and man. the fact that so many people work the system, you'd have all sorts of 20 year olds, 18 year olds, 17 year olds, 16 year olds, even 15 year olds. I mean, rite of passage ceremonies for young men often happen yep. when they went through puberty. So 13, yep. the Spartans started beating the shit out of them and toughening them up when they practically fell out of the womb, right? They <laughs> right. started real early. Six or seven, I, mean, I think. Yeah. I mean, it was hardcore. But the um, the point I'm making is we've kind of created a litigious system that doesn't allow the growth of of a real man because there's too many people that stand to make money off the injuries that are inevitable to a rite of passage ceremony. I mm -hmm. mean, there's going to be blood. There's going to be cuts. There's going to be bruises. There's going to be concussions. There's going to be tough, tough times. And, and then, then to top it off, when you do make it through your rite of passage ceremony, then the next thing comes. It's called getting your teeth knocked out or filed or having tattoos all over your body that are done by a chisel and ink made from a plant. And you, the pain is enough to take you to the edge of yourself. So you get through one rite of passage and then they make sure that you know that you're not a child by marking you or you, they cut you. I mean, the, the, I've studied a lot of these ceremonies and, and some of the things that they do after to inaugurate your manhood is as bad as the rite of passage was. Yeah. And, and Joseph Campbell says, 
they make sure that the child is completely extinguished in you. Mm. That's what a rite of passage ceremony. There is no child left or you are not ready to protect your tribe. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think it's a very fine line. And, and you see, they've got thousands of years of experience doing this in tribes. So the elders, the shaman, the chief, and the medicine man all knew how to set these things up to accomplish the objective because not only did they all go through it, but they all knew how dangerous it is to kill your own young men off because you can ruin your own tribe by doing stupid things in a rite yep. of passage. Mm -hmm. So to balance the to balance the challenge so that it's challenging enough but not destructive to the point of hurting a person beyond their capacity to recover and become a contributing member of the tribe takes a lot of skill. And there's very few people in our world today that could orchestrate that without ending up constantly being sued by somebody's relatives who think that they're crazy because they went to this rite of passage and came home with a broken arm. Mm -hmm. So we've kind of boxed ourselves into the child archetype probably for a very long time. Yeah, I mean, we it, it's become very difficult to break out of that, and we we are living in a society that is just kind of perpetuating that extended childhood. We're feeding it, we're we're nurturing it, we're we're allowing it, um, enabling it, even you know, because man, it's a lot easier. To your point, um, in in the very beginning, man, it's a lot easier to control a child than it is to control a man, a free thinking, um, self-realized, oh, you know, hell autonomous yes. <laughs> man. They're dangerous. Right? They're dangerous. That's a problem. But, you know, I can yeah. pacify a child, you know, yeah. I can give him his Just binky. Just throw some cotton candy in his Yeah, mouth. <laughs> some cotton candy. Here's your, here's your binky. Here's or your Or a blankie. video game or some porn. Here's some porn. Right, right. Here's a football game. You know, enjoy. Here, have, a, have some beer and some, you know, some chicken wings and enjoy, right? I mean, this is... Sadly, this is kind of what 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 masculinity has been kind of funneled towards is like, all right, there's this safe masculinity that society has allowed where it's like you can have your football, you can have your beer and your cigar, you can have your man room, right? But it's but it's a very sterile and or, or neutered idea of masculinity. But but most men, when they think about manly stuff, they think about cars and you know, all of these very I don't know. I, superficial. Superficial. Thank you. Very superficial, you know, almost just, just watered down versions of what a man could and should be. And, and again, this isn't, I, I mean, I was a pro athlete, so I can't poo poo it too much, but it's like, man, if the pinnacle if the peak of your masculinity revolves around a group of other men, watching a group of other men play a sport, that's, that might be a problem. You know what I mean? Like that's not, mm -hmm. again, you're vicariously living through someone else. And yes, there's very inspiring, you know, heroic things that, you know, people can do in the world of athletics that, that are great. But when your whole, you know, mood is based off of whether these guys won or lost, I mean, we've got the Super Bowl coming up. It'll probably have already happened by the time. And people live and die for this sporting event. And yeah, it's crazy. It's not, I, I don't. I mean, again, live your life however you want to, but I, I would venture to say you could be missing out on some things if that is if that is the peak for you. Yeah, it's it's and what is it? It's really a a, a herd of sheep that are drawn to an event. But isn't it interesting how many fights break out in the stands because somebody doesn't like their team or whatever? Mm -hmm. I mean that 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 just goes to show you like how childish our culture has become it's mm -hmm. like well it's, but it's, it's that bad you know that there's an inherent but there is an inherent like drive to fight for something we're just expressing it in really you know terrible and and you know stupid unintelligent ways, ways. A very yeah. unintelligent I mean, ways it's like man you could take yeah. that energy and accomplish so much more but you know bread and circuses and I mean, I think that explains quite a bit as to how men have gotten to the state that they are. Yeah. 
my next question is, is uh, at what point in a boy's life does the process of realizing what a man is begin? Mm. And when do you feel the transition from boyhood to manhood starts that process? Or, or when does that start, the transition from boyhood to manhood? And what do you feel the formative factors are that transform a boy? We've been talking a lot about those transformative factors. But the c- question is, and I think this is important for young men to hear, when is that transition from boyhood to manhood? Like my, my son's six, he'll be seven this month. He's, he's not ready to transition into manhood. And if I do that to him, in fact, if I made a mistake with my first son, you know, I was a paratrooper in the 82nd Airborne Division. I was really gung ho. I was young. I, you know, he, I became a father when I just turned 18. So here I was 23 year old, you know, trying to prove myself, trying to, make sure I was contributing to something worthy. I joined because of the Cuban Missile Crisis, and I really was concerned that we might become Russians if I didn't join the fight. Uh, My point is, my son entered into the military at about five years of age, which was too early. And so I trained him like a soldier. I taught him like a Mm -hmm. soldier, and I wounded him. And I, I, I have to carry the weight of that, but I can also say I didn't know any better. I didn't have enough experience fathering, and I didn't have any father. My real father died when I was eight. He drowned, and, and he left my mother when I was three. So the three of me and my brother and sister were, were, had no father, and then my stepfather was extremely brutal and had no sense of what a child was, so I was tasked with adult responsibilities from the beginning. And so here I was as a young father, and I really, the only view of the world I had was that the world is a tough fucking place, man, and people are going to work the shit out of you, and you got to be tough enough, or you'll never make a good living. You got to be ready to rise to the top. So the point is, is I took my son from childhood into manhood at about five or six years of age, and it was too much for him. I gave him too much responsibility, Mm -hmm. too much pressure. And he never really felt that I loved him. He, he, he felt like I was just something that I had. He was just something that I had to deal with as the product of sex, mm. but that I didn't really love him. But he didn't ever realize, look, the way I, the reason I worked so hard was to make sure him and his mother always had food and they were always protected. And I was willing to always give my life. But a child doesn't see the world that way. So the right. point I'm making is, that's not the time you transition a child or even begin to make them think about what it means to be a man. So, of course, I have my own opinions, but I'm just curious, what is your opinion on when the transition needs to begin? Yeah. And a boy really needs to start being educated as to the difference between a boy and man and and what that process is. I think, you know, speaking from just my own experience, you know, both in myself and then I, and then from my son. So I've got a, I've got a daughter who's eight and my son will be five in April. And, you know, it's really interesting because at four and a half, he can see it already. Like he's starting to understand now before that, you know, the, the, the cognition wasn't really there but he's already starting to like pay attention and emulate certain things. And it's not anything that we're forcing or or projecting on him. This is of his own volition, but right now he's on this. He has decided he's going to be a police officer. Um, It started with the Paw Patrol and they have a little, you know, you've got young kids, so I'm sure you're familiar. And they watch it all the time. man. (laughs) Chase the police dog is just the best thing on the planet. And so, you know, that has now evolved from, you know, now a policeman is the highest calling of, of any human on the planet to protect and serve other people. And so he is just like, you know, if, he, if we see a policeman, he has a little uniform that he wants to wear. And so he's already recognizing, you know, that there is something more. So I think with that, you know, young boys start to notice pretty early on the difference between you know, what a man is and what a man isn't, you know, my, my son can very easily distinguish me from my wife and in our different qualities and characteristics. And so right. I, I think, you know, as soon as they start becoming somewhat self-aware at around the age of four or five or whenever that tends to happen, 
typically around five with abstract thinking, they're able to see beyond the, op- the, the concrete. Yeah. For example, just to give you an example of that, research shows that prior to about the age of, it starts around four and progresses and gets deeper and deeper till seven and beyond. Mm-hmm. If you take a ball that has one half of its white and one half of its another color, and you hold it up so a kid can only see one side of the ball, kids that have not developed abstract thinking that are still in the concrete thinking model, and you say, what color is the ball? They'll say white. And you say, are you sure it's white? And they will be absolutely sure it's white. But once a child begins abstract thinking, they'll say, well, I can see white, but it might be another color on the other side because they can Mm. actually think beyond the concrete obvious of only what they can see. So for example, they can take a thought like a man and they can say, well, there's men that are warriors and there's men that are not very strong. In other words, a man is more than just somebody with a penis at that point. Mm -hmm. So they can actually see that there's shades of manliness and there's different expressions of it with abstract thinking. Yep. So you're talking about your son's reaching abstract thinking and using it. Yeah. And and that, so that's, I'm, you know, I'm kind of seeing that in real time. And so he's projecting himself into the future in this idea of becoming a protector of someone to uphold the law and, and all of these, you know, very virtuous things that he has you know, created or, or understands about what it means to be in law enforcement, which I think is great. And we're going to, you know, let him pursue whatever he wants to pursue. But a big part of that, you know, comes from their experience and, and what is influencing them. And I think that is a big characteristic of how boys transition into men, right? They need to be surrounded by men to to see what that model looks like and if they have good examples the likelihood of them developing and becoming good men is going to be way higher there's no guarantee right people are, are unpredictable and there's a lot of factors that go into our development but generally what we see is positive role models beget more positive role models so for yes you know, me as a dad i have to be very very cognizant of all of my actions, everything that I do, because my children, my son in particular is constantly watching and he's, you know, somewhere in the back of his head, he's taking notes and my behavior, my actions are going to very much influence just like you spoke to, you know, in your own experience. And, you know, my father's actions influence my development. So I think that's where it comes from. And it starts very early. And I think you know, somewhere along that puberty line. Yes, I agree. Puberty is where I think is where the man has to start orienting himself towards his son in the role of teaching him to be a man. Yes. And you're, you know, you're giving them skills throughout your, your, your job as a parent is to be endowing them with, with abilities, but you know, that's a broad general sense. I think as they start to come into that manhood in the beginning stages of puberty, then it needs to be a little bit more specified in, okay, this is a man. This is not what it needs to be a man. You know, this is, this is the appropriate behavior for a man. This is no longer appropriate. This is a boy. This is a child. This is what we are working towards and striving towards. And again, if he has good examples and the father is modeling that to the best of his ability, that transition from boy to man, I think will be a lot smoother and a lot easier. If he doesn't have that, he's going to look for it somewhere. You know, we're going to try and find it. I mean, you you have to have a guide. You can't figure this out on your own. It's so a survival either, instinct. Yeah. So you model it from, from what TV, from video games, from that's people the you see on the internet. If you don't give them a good role model, they will pick up role models that can be devastating. Mm-hmm. And 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 social media and the internet is not a good place because what you end up with is you end up with guys like the Liver King that pretend to be <laughs> somebody that turns out that they're not, and then you get all these young men going off and doing all this testosterone and drugs and biohacking because they're seeking an archetypal male figure, but they don't have the ability to distinguish a real man from a, a, a pretender. 
Yeah. And, and that's extremely dangerous as a father or as a parent. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a, too much of it going on out there because one of the things Leonard Sachs brought up in, in Boys Adrift is that parents are not parenting anymore. No. They're, they're using television, social media, and games to pacify their children so that they can do what they want to do, which is avoiding the responsibility of being a parent. And so what happens is their kids are taking on all these traits of illusory virtual beings, which is, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't interface with reality at all. No, because it's not real. And again, I mean, the, the, I don't know if you remember when we first started talking, I think I, I brought up Liver King and you're like, oh, I've never heard of that guy. And I was like, oh, just I looked wait. into him. The, yeah, I was like, just wait. Into... And, you know, anyone who has worked in the physical fitness industry for more than like, you know, two years can see clearly this guy is doing more than just eating liver. But, yeah. you know, this this facade was created and man what a great marketing ploy but you know we we have now again we have elevated the the necessity to make money above the uh, integrity of honesty and and in walking a true path for men you know and this is and this is the result that you get Right. And when you when you replace one with the other, when you replace just bottom line making money and with, you know, against something that actually should have had substance and could have been meaningful and impactful. Well, you know what that boils down to is weaving illusions. Yeah. And weaving illusions, I will warn everyone, attracts illusions mm. like attracts like and opposites attract. So what that means is you will attract people to you that generate illusions, which then you will have to deal with in your own life, but it'll always attract the opposite, which is people that can see the truth and mm. will point it out and your illusion will become broken. And if you're using that illusion to trick people to make money, then you could find yourself not only with your career destroyed, but with very serious legal problems that yeah. can wipe you out for the rest of your life. So... I will just reiterate, weaving illusions attracts illusions and it's dangerous and it's not a good thing to teach young people to do. And unfortunately, with all the social media, they're swimming in illusions all day. Uh, they are. And, and I think that it's a coping mechanism for a lot of people because they don't want to face the truth. So they lie to themselves. And so they, again, this is where, you know, a really honest reflection is so powerful and important again, for men in particular, is like, man, you need to be able to look in that mirror and truly see and know and understand yourself. Because if you don't, if you can't be real with yourself, then everything is an illusion. Your whole life is an illusion. And so sometimes we have to do things to strip that away, right? Like something like a rite of passage. And there's many other mechanisms that can can really shatter that illusion. And if you're not ready for it, they can be harsh or it can be really, you know, really beneficial and really powerful and, and meaningful and useful. Yeah, well, Shakespeare a long time ago said, to thine own self be true or thou mm -hmm. canst be true to any other man. And, and that's deep truth. Uh, well, it, well, it's on my mind. I just wanted to say Ben Greenfield just released a very comprehensive book called Boundless Parenting. Mm. And it's interviews with people he carefully selected that he thought had valuable advice to offer. And Angie and I wrote a very comprehensive chapter in the book, Boundless Parenting by Ben Greenfield. So if any of you listening um, want a book with some good parenting advice, um, I would highly recommend Boundless Parenting by Ben Greenfield. Hi, everybody. You know, when I first tried Paleo Valley's essential electrolytes, I had a noticeable increase in energy and an improved sense of stability in my body. This really surprised me because I did not suspect that I needed electrolytes. My wife, Penny, has been drinking a glass in the evening, eliminating the cramps she had been getting at night in her calves and has been getting a more restful, uninterrupted sleep. Paleo Valley's essential electrolytes come in three flavors, orange, lemon, lime, and watermelon. Electrolytes improve electrical conductivity in our nervous system, improve our capacity to retain water, 
support us with essential minerals and trace minerals, supporting the regulation of our hormonal system, body systems, and helping with overall well-being. For athletes that train hard and get a good sweat, Paleo Valley's electrolytes can be the difference between a great workout and an average workout. The difference between crossing the finish line first or looking at butts and heels as you cross it. A combination of electrolytes and water was found to be most effective at preventing increased anxiety, fatigue, and headaches. Migraines and headaches in general can result from dehydration, low calcium and or magnesium, trace mineral deficiencies, and hormonal imbalances. So why resort to drugs and painkillers that ultimately do nothing to address the common causes of headache when you can drink Paleo Valley's essential electrolytes and support your body in many ways at the same time? And you can reduce or eliminate sugar cravings that often result from a lack of sodium while giving your body a wide variety of minerals and trace minerals to support it. Most electrolytes offered on the market use synthetic isolated nutrients that do not contain the full spectrum of compounds found in organic whole foods. Paleo Valley's Essential Electrolytes contains ancient unprocessed sea salt with dozens of minerals and over 60 trace minerals your body needs. You will also enjoy the pure organic coconut powder and the refreshing flavor and essential potassium it provides. Together, this is a perfect balance of ingredients that will not only give you improved capacity for exercise, better hydration, and reduce chances of unwanted headaches, muscle cramping, and premature fatigue, but will support your body with the essential minerals and trace minerals that help keep you balanced and in a state of well-being. Paleo Valley's essential electrolytes are also third-party tested to ensure purity in all ingredients. To get your essential electrolytes now, go to paleovalley.com, that's P-A-L-E-O, valley.com and save 15% on your purchase using the code capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 15. That's check in all caps, 15. Check 15 on checkout. My family and I use Paleo Valley's excellent products every day and love them, and I'm very confident you will too. To move on, and you know, we're, we're well into the show, so we'll kind of start moving towards some conclusion here. Mm-hmm. We've talked about the lack of formal rights of of rite of passage process, the serious lack of leadership from parents and elders, what kind of challenges um, are necessary for young men to engage in order to develop the essential qualities of being an authentic man who meets the duties essential to men if we are to have healthy families, societies, and culture in the world today. So, you know, what are some of the things that young men and even women can engage in your opinion, lacking a a tribal structure or a well-structured rite of passage ceremony that still give us the opportunity to get some form of legitimate feedback, self-reflection, and ultimately can serve, if not as an entire rite of passage, as a component of a rite of passage. For example, there's things that you're going to learn in the rite of passage of combat of sports, but you won't learn them. For example, you won't learn negotiation skills. You won't learn communication skills. You might learn how to kick some ass and how to take some pain, but you won't learn how to get along with your wife better. Right. And as I often say, I don't, I don't care if you squat a thousand pounds, if you can't get along with your wife, because you've just wasted a lot of time in the gym that you should have been in learning relationship skills. So that's just a waste of time. Um, any suggestions from you on options for young men out there? Absolutely. I, I mean, I think bringing it kind of full circle, anything that pushes you to find those edges that we that we spoke about, it would be would be pretty sufficient. And that again can be a, a number of things, right? I mean, something like combat sports, like wrestling, will do that. Um, any kind of really long endurance feat can do that. Yes. Essentially what you're looking for, and this has been, again, my experience is, you know, we consist of mind, body, and spirit, right? Yes. And, you know, to, to really delve into the mind, you have to kind of remove the body from, from the equation, right? And you can do that through really hard effort, really long effort. Your body breaks down. It doesn't want to go anymore. And the only thing that's left to drive you is your mind and your mental state. And your mind can push your body to continue doing the thing. Well, on a long enough timeline, that mind starts to give way too. You know, when you're in hour six 
or hour eight or whatever, you know, of your endurance feed, or, you know, maybe you're in a sweat lodge and it, you know, man, your, your body wanted to quit and your mind kept going and now it's so hot or, you know, something along those lines. It's really pushing those limits, right? Once the mind gives way, the only thing that's hanging on at that point is now your spirit. So you have to strip away the body, strip away the mind, and now you can get to the essence and that spirit and really see, okay, what, what am I made of? Who am I at my core? What am I, what can I handle? And, you know, you ha- start to have some real conversations with yourself. Uh, and I think that, <laughs> and God. that's, and God, and, and, you know, anything <laughs> that can safely and responsibly get you to that point, I think is a good rite of passage, you know? I wouldn't recommend it for young boys, but I think for a lot of men who have matured um, into adulthood, but are still seeking that obviously, you know, plant medicine can be, it's not for everyone. I don't necessarily say you have to go that route, but that is an option as well. And a lot of people have, you know, been able to remove their mind and body (laughs) through the use of, you know, plant medicines and ceremonies in that not obviously not in a recreational, Hey, let's just do this and get weird, but in a very controlled environment, that's another great, you know, method, not, not for kids, but for, you know, adult men who maybe never got that rite of passage and are looking for something, but can't physically take their first MMA fight, or they can't go do, you know, a a 24 hour ultra marathon kind of experience. I think when you're old enough to start entertaining, stealing your mother's car, you're old enough to start entering a rite of passage. Yeah, I think that's fair. Right? Think, when, yeah. when, when, you're, when you're at the age where you have adult responsibilities, but you're avoiding the adult part of the responsibility, and you're starting to deal in illusions to feed that instant gratification without realizing the ramifications of a 4,000-pound machine going too fast, it's time for you to enter a rite of passage in an environment where you're not going to get yourself or other people killed. Yeah. And, you know, young men, when their testosterone kicks in, they start getting wild and crazy and they think they're supermen and they don't realize how perishable they are and other people and life itself is. And so, and I, I really think that personally, that once a young man goes through puberty, that's when it's really important for a father to begin to keep a, an eagle's eye on how that mind is processing reality. Yeah. Because once you add testosterone to a child's mind, you have problems because they are at that dangerous knife's edge where they start dabbling in the use of knives, weapons, fire, um, explosives, whatever they can get their hands on, you know, and and emulating men without being men. And that's when limbs get lost, eyes get lost, bones get broken, Mm -hmm. death happens. And and it's important that we don't, and this is part of the problem with society, that we don't coddle them and, and, you know, bubble wrap them and insulate them from those things. No, that's that's also a problem. You know, we can't just remove all sense of danger and say, okay, well now they'll be fine because you can't do that. You can maybe do that in a closed environment, but in the open world, you know, danger is, is real and present at all times. And so that's where that guidance is, is so vital where you have, you know, and it's not just the father, it's, it's the tribe, it's the leaders of the tribe. It's not just one guy, yeah. you know, it takes a no, village, I'm just, you know, it's, you our, gotta it's have, our culture though. Our culture is yes. broken. We don't have a tribal culture. So we've got this monogamous unit. And I think that's a danger of monogamy is it kills the tribal concept. And I, you know, you know, I have two wives and, and we forever are, are saying, wow, you know, these kids really get a lot more love support and it's easier on both women. It's easier on me because I can't subscribe to something that isn't true to my heart. And I also have studied tribal society so much. And there's a saying, it takes a tribe to raise a child. And it's damn true. And this is one of the things because men keep getting caught in the pursuit of money. And so what happens is, and I did this with my first wife, I was just hell bent for leather to make more money and and advance my career. So she was isolated having to raise our son by herself. And that's how women get completely burned out. Yep. That's how they get 
They feel unloved by their partner. And it's really this paradox because the man thinks he's doing what he should be doing to protect the family, but forgets that money doesn't equal love. It doesn't mm -hmm. equal nurture. It doesn't equal education. So it's a, it's a, we, we've got this sort of industrialized, corporatized, monotheistic, mono orientation toward the family. And I think it's really put us in a lot of trouble, led to a lot of drug use, a lot of chronic ailments and diseases and burnout for men and women. Yeah. And I think, I think one of the things we've got to do for ourselves as adults and for young men is we've got to start working with the concept of tribe to bring people that have common mission, vision, and values. And I've rehabilitated countless burned out women. And I say, look, you've got to create a tribe. What does that mean? It means if, if you haven't got time to go to an aerobics class or to do something that's nourishing for you to help you have a sense of yourself and not be completely and utterly obliterated by the responsibility of being a parent, find another woman in the same situation as you and you say, okay, Mondays, you bring your kid to me. Will you go for two hours to the beauty salon or to read or to the swimming pool or to the jazzercise or to the aerobics or to the gym? And Wednesday, I bring my kid to you and you get a bunch of people together that all need that support. And that's the use of the tribal awareness and the tribal concept, which is, it's, it's way overdue. It really is. And I mean, you, you, you said the word it's isolation and we have, yeah. you know, in our society, we have isolated ourselves, you know, to, to a really bad place and, and to the detriment of everyone involved where, and, and, you know, I think men are guilty of this. I think a lot because we don't want to ask for help. Right. Again, right. that pride thing comes in and, you know, maybe, or we don't know anyone that we can ask for help. We don't know where to find someone who, who do we even go to? You know, maybe I'm, fairly adept at, at doing certain things, but man, I don't, I look around and I can't find another guy who's, you know, got a pot to piss in, you know, and is, is worth, uh, is worth a damn. So what do I, what do I do there? And I think that's a challenge. The work thing that you mentioned is a big issue where you're living in two different separate realities where the wife is drowning, yeah. right. In, in, and then the husband is also drowning. He just doesn't realize it because he thinks he's been, you know, led to believe that he's doing the right thing by, you know, working 40, 50, 60, 80 hours a week in a, in a hunter gatherer society. I, I think that they said it's the, the average amount of work a person would do in a week to survive in that about 15 to 20 hours. Yeah, work. the research shows you can look at the book Metabolic Man 10,000 Years from Eden by okay. um by Charles Heiser Worthen who did extensive research on this. He showed the average tribal society could meet their basic needs in three and a half to four hours a day. There you and go. The young the young parents and adults went out and did the hunting and gathering while the grandparents, the wise ones, educated the children. And then when the parents came home, they did arts, crafts, sang, danced, mm -hmm. played, and lived for the rest of the day. Yeah. So we've got the whole thing completely fucking inverted. Oh, yeah. No, it's, 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 I mean, it's a really messed up system. And I think people are so, have become so indoctrinated, like, well, this is just the way that it is. Like, they can't see, it can't conceive any other way of existing. And so I think as parents, we need to recognize, like, hey, We've got to we've got to start shifting our mindset and our mentality, and that doesn't mean everyone can just go quit their jobs, you know, and just be a bunch of you know hippies living in a commune in the woods. Although, you know, I'm not saying you can't do that either, but at the same time, you know, this this community, this tribe, we need to be finding ways to build that and finding ways to yes meet our needs and and provide and put food on the table. But as men, providing is so much more than monetary value. Like you said, we provide love, we provide protection, support, we provide knowledge and inspiration. We provide order to, to our realm, you know, to our, our little kingdom, our house that we live in. You know, my job as a dad 
is like when everything is falling to shit and everything is going crazy, like I can't just, I can't lose it. I have to be the one that holds it together and keeps the, the wheels on the track. Otherwise it all falls apart. And if I, if yeah. I put that responsibility solely on my wife, because I'm too focused on my job and she has to manage every aspect of everything, like you said, she's going to burn out. And now I've just, I've just, you know, paralyzed my partner. I, I had a partner in yep. this thing. I had a, I had a teammate and I just freaking kneecapped him because yep. I, I'm off pursuing something that I thought was good, but it actually has been, it's, it's the source of <laughs> most of my problems. Yes. And I think part of it is, and I, I can say this, that I've learned it the hard way is we have such an egocentric culture that men have a hard time making the transition from I to we. And, and there's the old saying, there is no I in we. So once you're in a relationship, you have a partner, you have kids, it's very important for a man to learn to navigate his personal needs and his own dreams, goals, desires, and professional pursuits, but also say, what is it that my wife needs? What is it that my kids need? And how can I make that transition so I feed myself enough to be whole, but I don't lose sight of the relationship? Because without the relationship, I'm really not a man in the relationship if I don't meet the requirements of a healthy relationship. Mm -hmm. I'm really just a soloist who thinks he's a man because he's making lots of money or getting rewards. And, 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 and I, had, uh, I had to go through a lot of tough times myself. I went through a divorce after a 17-year marriage. But ultimately, and even to this day, I'm still learning because, you know, I'm, I'm very like an arrow flying. I've always got a mission to accomplish. And I've been that way my whole life. I'm kind of what Doug Brofman calls the driven personality. And, but my, my, my wives have been teaching me how important it is to get home, to spend time and to eat meals with the kids. And so I'm still at 61 learning how to be a, a, a more balanced contributor instead of just the pathfinder. Single when I was track. in the military, I was a pathfinder. They always put me out in front because I was a good soldier. And they say, your job is to find the enemies before we contact them. And so I've always had this pioneering lead the way mentality. And I walk back to the guys back there and tell them what's going on. And I, I get to be left alone. I've never really liked the group kind of anything. I'm not a sheep guy. Yeah. So I've always made sure I did the work to put myself in a position where I didn't get caught in group think because yeah. I don't like group think. Well, and we need those individuals. We have to have those guys. Like that's an integral yeah. part, but you know, that guy's got to come back into the fold at some point as well too. You can't, he's got to come home. You got to come home. You got to come and, home. And, I, and, and it, you have to make sure that when you go home, it's a home. Yes. Yes. Well, I mean, it's, it's amazing how much we can learn from the ones who love us, right? From our wives, from our kids. If, if, we're, yeah. if we're present and we pay attention, man, they can really teach us some valuable lessons. And, and I can, you know, I've, I've become very quick to recognize if I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing or if I'm starting to slip up by the state of, of things in my household. If, if my, the, if my kids are struggling with things, my wife is struggling with things. It's easy to look like, oh man, they just had a bad day or like, oh, she's just whatever. But I take responsibility for that. Like it's my job. If they're, if, if my team, my tribe is having hardships, then I, that, that comes for me. And then if I look, I'm like, oh, you know what? Man, my nose was has been stuck in this phone answering emails, you know, all week. No wonder things are falling apart. I'm not giving them the attention they deserve and they need. And so yeah. I can use that as as a gauge to, you know, evaluate how I'm doing. And and so I, I try to recognize it as soon as I can and, and course correct, because again, none of us none of us are perfect. And speaking to the male, you know, that pathfinder. We do have to recognize it's important for the male to be able to leave. Again, our, our species would not have survived if, if men and women are different. They're wired differently. The, the women, generally speaking, are there to nurture and stay. And, you know, my wife could spend every second of every day with our kids. 
no problem. I love my kids to death, but if I don't go out and do some things, I'm going to start to fall apart and then I'm not going to be able to serve them best. Right. So I started the hunter, imploding. <laughs> yeah. The hunter, the, the gatherer, the, the, the warrior that is within us has to go away. We have to leave the home to accomplish what we need to accomplish. So I'm not saying everybody quit their guy, their job and just, you know, hang out around the house and do nothing. You have to go, but you have to make sure you're coming back. And like you said, you got to make sure you have an actual home to come back to, not four walls and a roof. There's a difference between a house and a home. Yeah. Mark Gaffney gives a beautiful example. He says, men are lines and women are circles. Hmm. You know, a line's always going somewhere, but a circle contains yep. the family, right? So what I've had to learn is as line-like as I can be or arrow-like, there's a certain time every day or multiple times where I have to wrap my line around in a circle. I got I to gotta, I gotta get off the arrow flight and put my arms around my kids, my wives. I've got I've to gotta pause the arrow and wrap the line around the people that need to be loved and supported. And, and it, it, in all fairness to young men, look, I'm 61 and I'm still learning this. And, and I didn't have good role models because everybody around me was an arrow, right? It was all, all arrow all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and society has kind of led us to believe that for men, that is your only role that is your only value and that's the only thing that matters and it, it is it's a it's a delicate line to walk it's a hard balance to figure that out and like i said before i can't i can't give anyone that answer of what percentage of this to that they need to do but what i what i what i think what i hope that we've kind of sparked is to at least start asking that question you know yes. for men in particular to start wondering okay what is the appropriate amount of you know going and, and putting energy into my career and my job and these pursuits compared to my wife and my kids and, and, you know, all of these other things that are equally, if not more important. I mean, the job, the job only exists so that they can, you can, you know, keep them alive. Right. Right. With, if you, if, if they could just exist without the job, you shouldn't have to go do that. Now you might have some other thing to pursue, but you know, for your own fulfillment, you know, and that's a whole different different subject, but you got to know what you're working for. But the responsibility is still there. Yeah. You, you got to know what you're working for. Yeah, exactly. And and that's what, what, what I want to say before we jump off of this, because I put enough yeah. down there to talk for another hour. But, you know, <laughs> one of my, one of my key things that I think is very, very important for young men or young women is learning to have a clear sense of direction. In fact, when I, I've worked with a lot of eating disorder uh, issues mm. and, and, and a long career of dealing with eating disorders. So I've studied a lot of the literature. And one of the things that I found through studying all the literature is I think uh, it was years ago, but I read a meta analysis where they look at like many, many studies and then look for what are the common denominators. And what they found, the most common denominator that produces eating disorders and even things like cutting in children parents without a sense of direction in their life. Wow. And so imagine being a child in the back seat of the car and your mm -hmm. parents are driving down the freeway fighting over which way they're going to go to get to some place they're not sure how to get to. That would leave mm. a child scared. I've experienced it before as a child. Yeah. So when mom and dad don't have a sense of mission, vision and values that's guiding the family so that even the kids feel like mom and dad know where they're going and they can relax in the back of the car metaphorically, then they get nervous and they have to start coming up with coping mechanisms and eating disorders and cutting and pulling hair out and damaging oneself and dabbling in mm -hmm. drugs. Those are all coping disorders. So the key point is when mom and dad don't have a clear sense of direction, the kids are scared. And when you're a young man or a young woman, if you don't have a clear sense of direction, then you're just bouncing around in the world. And that makes you a target for people that can spot that. And that's what the technology that's being used to round the minds of young people up. See, because someone like you and I, you just said, there's a certain time when I realize I've been 
answering too many text messages, phone calls, etc. on my phone, and I've got to go back to do my work in the nest to hold the nest together. Because you you have something that gives you a reminder, hey, I've crossed the threshold. Now there's other things I've got to do. But if you're if you don't have responsibilities of a family or people that you're caring for or a tribe that you're part of, then you have to be aware of what it is that you need to keep yourself in balance, which I will talk about before we close. So my tip here, and this is about how do you create a rite of passage? Well, you get clear on what's important to you at this time in your life. And one of the most important things, as we've discussed, is mastering something. But Mm -hmm. master something, not that somebody else wants you to master, master something that your heart's in it, or you're never going to do the work to be a master. I don't care if it's a sport or if it's a hobby, if it's art, if it's uh, weaving, knitting, singing. It, all that matters is that you love it enough to do the work to reach a level of mastery where you know what it feels like to have a sense of of reaching the point where you don't have to follow the rules because the rules are now part of you and you can work beyond the rules, right? Great artists, great artists go to art school and they learn all the rules, but the ones that become really great artists are the ones that know how to break the rules because they've mastered the rules, right? And so mastery is learning the rules that have been figured out by all the other that created mastery and then learned how to go beyond them. And so. A mission means where am I going? What what am what am I about? Like, you know, if you're a soldier, your mission is to defeat the enemy. If you're a business, then your mission is to give a good service and a good product so people want to come back. What is your vision? What do you see happening next week, next month, next year? And what values are going to get you from today to next year so you can actually achieve your objectives? And who is your tribe and do they share those values and are they in line in alignment with the mission and are they contributing to the fulfillment of that mission? If they're not, then you've got to choose new friends, new team members, new dream team members, mm-hmm. new tribe members, or you've got to just switch tribes or you're going to get lost. Or you're never going to make, make it to where you're trying to go. I mean, it's just... right. A simple fact, like it's just going to impede your progress. And, you know, so using, using pathfinding is, is kind of a, a, an allegory here. You know, you talked about a lot of things where like, man, you need, you need a map and a map is great, but it's not the because <laughs> it, it shows you everything. Right. But that map means nothing. If you don't know where you are on it, on the right? map, so you have to know. <laughs> On, on the map, right? I mean, okay, I have this map, but where am I? So, I mean, you, 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 you have to have a map and you have to be able to orient yourself to where you are on that map. And that's knowing, being honest with who you are and where you're at right now. Then you can choose a destination and then you have to have a compass, right? Something that's going to guide you and let you know if you are actually heading in the correct direction. Yeah, so, that's values. Yeah. And that's your values. It's like, what is important? That is your compass. And when you start to, you should be able to feel, and it's yes. kind of a sensitivity. You should feel when I'm moving away from my values. I, yeah. I don't know. I don't know that anyone after they do something that again, again, isn't like bring it back to porn, right? I don't know anyone. And I would challenge this that like, after they have watched porn and like have gone to completion they're like yeah i feel really good about that man just what a wholesome you know joyous feeling i have in my heart now from this experience i can't wait to tell my pastor about this (laughs) yeah i'm gonna share this with my grandma she's gonna be so stoked when i describe you know mom i blew three (laughs) loads today on (laughs) debbie does dallas you know right it's you know it's a new record so yeah. I, I think that that we you know we have something inside of us right that that kind of if we can tune in and listen to it that that can guide us right they yes. can tell us yeah. right from wrong inherently outside of moral construct outside of society I think we are endowed and instilled with a sense of of right or wrong and what is what is good and what is bad 
And we need to be able to tune in and listen to that and let that be our compass and, and guide us and make sure that our values are in line with that and feel our way through. And then we can use our map, then we can orient, then we can, you know, actually chart a course and make an attempt to get to where we're going. And we may decide, you know what, actually, now that I'm this close to it and I can see, I don't want to go up that hill or down that hill because I, I'm going to pursue something else. And that's fine too. I think a lot of young people get stymied and, okay, well, I have to choose this thing and this is it, my only choice, right? And I better get it right. You know, you talk to a kid, uh, a high school kid, hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? What, do you, what are you going to major in in college? And a lot of them know exactly what it is. And a lot of them will have a complete meltdown because they're like, I have no idea, but oh my gosh, the pressure, what if I get it wrong and I waste all this time? And I, I think as long as you are being true to yourself and you're following something, not for someone else's benefit, but for your own, right? Yeah. Whether you get there or not, it is the pursuit of it. And if you change course, that's okay too. Now you can't just jump every time something gets hard, jump ship and do something different. But you know, nothing in this life is really set in stone. You have the power to create the life that you want to leave at any point, at any point you can say, Hey, you know what? I'm, I'm going to do something differently. I can, I'm going to make a change in this direction and pursue that instead. Well, once the soul reaches the point at which it's gained what it's meant to gain in order to get to the next point in its evolution, I think there's a natural sense of completion, satiation, like I don't need to play football anymore. I've, I've I've got that fulfilled. Just like mm -hmm. you said, you know, you don't need to go back and be a pro fighter anymore because your your soul's intuitive guidance system says, Josh, your your level of maturation now is beyond that. You like you said, you don't have to prove in, that you're a tough guy or that you can deal with someone in an alley or whatever. So spending more time in martial arts is like becoming a thousand pound squatter, but you still haven't learned communication skills. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think if we, and this is my next point, you see, love is what produces the magnetic field that orients our compass. Mm. If you're just doing what you're told to do by other people, like your parents, in other words, you wanted to be a musician, but they demanded you go to law school then there's no love there. So your compass is not going to orient yourself. You're never actually going to really do your best because you're actually maintaining the child position by letting your parents control you when you really are now an adult and should be acting like an adult and taking fulfillment for where your heart wants you to go. So uh, part of being successful in, a, in your youth as a young adult is orienting yourself to where your heart wants you to go so there's a sense of fulfillment and when you orient yourself to where your heart wants to go what i find is you usually end up around other people that have used love to bring themselves there so then you find mentors that are love centered not ego centered who are passionate not feeling obligated yeah right and so i think that's important and before I forget, I wanted to mention for the listeners, I have a whole series of podcasts called Evolve Yourself. So I've got one called Evolve Yourself Physically, another one Evolve Yourself Emotionally, the next one is Evolve Yourself Mentally, the next one is Evolve Yourself Spiritually, and the final in the series is Evolve Your Career. And there's a lot of very, very important information for young people or people that are in a life transition, like someone going through a midlife crisis or anyone that's trying to find themselves. And those podcasts are still in the top 10 to this very day. And I did them in the first year of the podcast. So, you know, I'm on 200 and something episodes now. So they're, they're, uh, I think everyone should consider listening to them if they feel like they need physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, or career guidance, because I really share a lot of what I've learned through the school of hard knocks. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I hope you're enjoying the show. I imagine you know that magnesium is one of the minerals that people in North America are the most efficient in, but it's an extremely important mineral to have in your 
diet regularly. And believe it or not, Bioptimizers has improved what was already well known to be the best magnesium formula out there called Magnesium Breakthrough. So I've got Wade Lightheart with me to explain what it is they've done to improve this already excellent formula. Wade, what is new about your new Mag Breakthrough formula? Well, it's called sucrosomial magnesium. So we have seven different types of magnesium in Magnesium Breakthrough because they're uptaken by different parts of the body. But a new type of magnesium has been created called sucrosomial. And what it shows in the research in science is that it's actually even more absorbable by the body, particularly inside of the brain, which is a big aspect uh, to enhance neurotransmitter formation, as well as ensuring the rest and relax response in the nervous system that a lot of people will take magnesium for. They find it, you know, clocks them down, helps them sleep better, allows for the relaxation of striated and smooth muscle tissue in the body, which creates an energetic relief. And so when we added sucrosomial, we were able to demonstrate inside our lab facility that we were able to get better improvements. Of course, we have a partnership with the Birch International University. We have some patents we're working on, uh, which will kind of relay some of these things. But sucrosomial was a no-brainer when we added to the formula, improved the results or improved the uptake. And the reports back from our testing team were like, wow, this we get more results with less caps. And that's always the goal for our company. That's excellent. I love it. I, I always say, and people have probably heard me say it before, I just am so amazed how you guys are constantly and always improving and working your best to not only make better products for us, but it doesn't seem to me that it gets more expensive as you make them better. So that's a real gift to the world. Thank you. This month, Bioptimizers have a special gift with purchase offer. When you buy a three-month supply of Magnesium Breakthrough, you not only save 25%, you also get a free gift of a bottle of Masszymes and a bottle of P3OM. And when you purchase a five-month supply of Magnesium Breakthrough, you save 30% and get free bottles of Masszymes, P3OM, and HLC. An incredible offer no matter how you slice it. To take advantage of this special offer now, go to magbreakthrough.com forward slash living 4D. That's magbreakthrough.com forward slash living 4D. Enjoy. That was such a good word, though, where following your heart, you know, and, and acting out of love. And I think that, man, we, we have really moved so far away from that in society yeah. and in if we could get back to that, we would be in such a, so much better place. But, you know, I don't, I, I think too many people, they don't, they're not even sure how to listen to their heart anymore. You know, they don't even know what it sounds like. They can't hear that voice. You're you right. Know? And I'm going to give you a tip. Thank you for bringing that up. Cause that's a really pertinent point you just made. And the answer to that riddle is start doing things you love to do so you actually mm. practice making love, right? If you like to make music, spend time each day. My system of four doctors, Dr. Happiness, Dr. Diet, Dr. Movement, and Dr. <laughs> Quiet. Dr. Happiness is the chief physician who's responsible for establishing your values on how much movement you need and what type, what quality of food and what proportions, how much rest you need, to be at your best and having time for introspection and self-reflection each day. But Dr. Happy is the one that's responsible for identifying what is happy making for me and what is it that I can do on a daily, weekly basis so that I actually don't forget how to create happiness and end up in a codependent situation where I expect other people to make me happy, which is a death sentence to any relationship personally or professionally. Mm -hmm. So I love stacking rocks. I love painting. I love lifting weights. I love walking on my property. I love making music. I love shamanic drumming. I love sitting down with a bag of good pot and painting with no intention of giving a shit what I paint just for the joy of it. I love good jokes. I love good movies. Um, you know, I love sex. So you see, what I'm saying is I take responsibility for practicing making love in ways that allow me to let my heart paint, let my heart choose which rocks to stack, 
let my heart design my workout. I don't go in with a fixed, rigid idea. I got to do this or I'm not going to put. I go in and say, what feels good? What could I do mm-hmm. in the gym that would ultimately leave me enjoying the process of being here and participating? Not because I think I have to, not because I'm going to beat myself up if I don't, but because I want to have the experience of making love. And so the answer to your important query and, and point is the way you learn to feel your heart again is you do things that are safe. And I'll tell you what happens if you don't. All addictions are attempts at safe love. Mm. No beer bottle ever complains about how you kiss it. No cigarette ever complains that your tongue's not skilled enough. No shot of, of heroin ever complains that your blood isn't sweet enough. When persons have addictions, it's all, and I've worked with thousands of them, all addictions are attempts at safe love. If you don't know how to love yourself in ways that are nourishing and safe for you, the stress of being that isolated from love leads you to seeking something that numbs you from the pain you're creating by not learning to love. And it's dangerous as hell. The best thing you can do, if you love your plants, go garden. If you love your dog, play with your dog. Whatever it is that gives you that sense of connection and heart opening, and there's not a lot of judgment involved, that's the way you open the door to the heart. And without your heart, your compass never works well because you use your head. Mm -hmm. And I will warn everybody, only (laughs) the heart can deliver authentic judgment to the head. The head will always No, the head will always judge based on data, but the heart judges based on what is authentically true and feels real. So until we let our heart start managing our rational mind, we can become so rational that we forget the emotional feeling nature in ourselves and then we become someone who's highly respected at work as a smart person, but dies of cancer. Mm. Well, man, that is such a powerful concept. And, you know, I I can already hear people saying, well, I mean, yeah, but you're Paul check. Of course you can do all these things. You've, you're, you've gotten yourself to a state where now you can enjoy all these things. And I think it's tragic that people don't realize that they have that choice. That they can make Everyone that does. same choice. Everybody does. We, we, we feel like, well, that's just for someone else. But for me, I have all these other things and I have all these excuses and reasons why I could never do this or pursue that or, you know, and it, it's just, it's just, man, it, it breaks my heart that there's so many people out there that, that just never even attempt it because they don't know that it's possible, but you can make that choice every day. Every day you wake you up, can. you have the choice to to do what the things and live and create the life that you want to live. We are the creators of, we are captain commander of our own destiny, but so many people relinquish that control to someone else because I think they're afraid to take the responsibility. But man, when you step up and you believe in yourself and know that you can steer the ship, you can take it to anywhere you want to go. And I, I, man, I just wish more people would be willing to take the helm instead of sit in the back seat of their life and, you know, crash into whatever rocks the tides may take them into. Well, if you don't take the helm, you drop the M mm. off the word helm yeah. and you end up in hell. Right. And That's you know, where you, just, yeah. just, just to show you how easy it is to in, find a, a way to love what you're doing. Do you love a good shit? <laughs> Who doesn't? Well, then look, you're going to take one, hopefully at least a couple times a day. So if you're so busy that you got nothing else to do, just sit down and go, ah, and really enjoy a good poop, right? If do you, everyone stops to eat, but most of them eat so fast, they don't even taste their food. They don't even know if they're eating poison or real food. I love to eat. So if I'm busy, I'm about to go have lunch and I'm going to taste it. I'm going to smell it. I'm going to feel the energy coming into my body. 
It's going to open my mm -hmm. heart. I'm going to give, I'm going to pray for that food. I'm going to say, thank you, mother nature. Thank you. Great spirit. Thank you. Dear food spirits for helping me live in love fully. I invite you to become human with me and help make the world a better place for all living beings. You don't need to go out of your way to figure out what you're going to do to blow your heart wide open when you can have a good shit and enjoy mm -hmm. a good meal, right? You, you start with what you can do. It's a shift in awareness. Mm -hmm. Wow. I can taste my food. This is an amazing blueberry. How would my life be different if I had no food? Will it be the shits? So there's something to love, right? Clean yeah. water is something to love. Getting a hug Man. from someone is something to love. Giving a hug is something to love. There's a lot Feeling of ways. The sunshine. You know, right. walking out and just seeing light shining, emanating from the heavens above, you know, Absolutely. the warmth of that. I mean, yeah, it just so many, yeah, you know, it, but it's, it's perspective and it's, you know, learning gratitude, which I think gets thrown around a little bit too much. Absolutely. Learning not to talk yourself out of what you already have. Be aware mm -hmm. of all the things that make your life beautiful. And the simple thing I tell my students and my patients is if you're not sure what you love, just start asking yourself, what happens if I don't get to poop? What happens if I don't get to have sex? What happens if I don't get to eat? What happens if I don't get to see my wife or my husband or my kids? And all mm -hmm. of a sudden you realize there's a lot of things you love, but you have assumed them. Yeah. You're taking it for granted taking it for granted. And when you start taking shit for granted, life gets narrow mm -hmm. and you lose touch with what the word God means. And when you lose yeah. touch with the word God, you end up with nothing but matter and matter is full of inertia. Hmm. And the more matter oriented you become, the more material like you become and the harder it is to get yourself to be love, to create love and to feel love. And that's the danger of a scientific materialistic agenda. And that's exactly what the World Economic Forum is. Mm -hmm. yeah. Forget God, forget the soul. That's bullshit. You're hackable. We can control you. You'll own nothing and you'll be happy. Well, that sounds exactly like a corporate farm animal to me that's trapped in a cage and has been brainwashed into thinking it's happy while it's eating poison and dying and being someone else's pincushion. Most people are already at that state. They just don't realize it, you know. It, this that's isn't why a they're futuristic. So to, no, yeah, this that's is why they're so now. easy to capture. That's why mm -hmm. they're so easy to capture. And you know what I say to the World Economic Forum? If that's true, then you do it first. We'll watch and we'll see how the experiment turns out. Yeah. Let me know how right? that works while, for you. While you're flying around in your jets eating caviar, telling us <laughs> we got to pay carbon taxes and eat bugs, any asshole can do that. Let me see you do it first. Mm -hmm. And that that's the real test. So until they do that, I say we better all wake up and, and get involved in the world before the, it's taken from us. A point I want to get to before I forget. One of the yes. things I think is very important for young people, budding adults, learning to be men, learning to be women, is learning to differentiate the difference between discomfort that grows you and mm. pain that disables you. Yes. Right? Like you and I both know, I can guarantee you, you know, you've seen guys get in a fight and not know when to fucking stop because they're getting their ass kicked and just keep on dragging themselves off the floor to get another concussion after another concussion. That's not the well, intelligent I've, I've management. I've been that guy. You know, unfortunately, I, I, I haven't. <laughs> I've been I've been the one that says, "Are you sure you want to get off the ground right now?" <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I, I've I've been on both sides of the fence, and uh, you know, while there is some value in knowing what you're capable of and where that threshold, where that quitting point truly lies, man, there there is some irreparable damage that, you know, I have, I have incurred in terms of like TBIs and, and stuff that, yeah. you know, I, I've been doing a lot to mitigate and hopefully, you know, with some, some intervention. And that was kind of the, the whole impetus of the, the plant medicine direction of, of trying to, to work through that. And again, why I said, Hey, I wouldn't follow me through a buffet line because <laughs> you, you may not <laughs> might like, be bumpy. <laughs> like what ends up on your plate. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's, it, it's a really valuable skill that, you know, sometimes we 
we, we don't learn or we have to learn the hard way. And so if we can avoid doing it the hard way, I mean, that's, that is really ideal. Well, I'll tell you something my dad told me when I was young and it stuck like skunk smell. And I'm referring to differentiating discomfort that grows from pain that disables. My dad said, fool mm -hmm. me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Okay. So if I go, like I've had many bad crashes that resulted in broken bones, internal bleeding, concussions, and hospital visits racing motocross. But I learned where that line was and I learned to start recognizing it earlier. And I also learned there's a difference between being a fool that's going fast and being a skilled racer. And so when, when you sense yourself getting to the foolish side, that's when you got to pull the reins in a little bit. Because you're not going to win yeah. a race if you're wrapped around a tree and dead. Right. You know, I, I spent a lot of time in martial arts and boxing, and I've fought with guys that are really painful. And there's a time when I just say, okay, I got to bow, because if I go one round further, I might end up brain dead. And I've learned that that guy is a teacher for me, but I'm not going to let him beat the living piss out of me just to fill his ego with the joy of beating me into a pulp. There's well, a certain a great time. lesson. No, you know, so the point <laughs> I'm making is to, to, to navigate becoming a man or mm -hmm. a woman. Women are a little more dialed in because they're more in touch with their feelings. Yeah. You have to start paying attention. When is being a tough guy disabling and when is being brave enough to make yourself uncomfortable contributing to your ability to become a man to learn to deal with the discomfort that's part of being a man and yeah. that's that's part of growing up is finding that edge but what my call is as a 61 year old man is to say wake up pay attention yeah. because when you cross the line into pain that disables it disables you mm -hmm. and I and got a lot of no coming back. I got a lot of broken bones in my body. I've had six real bad concussions. I couldn't think straight. I had to go to neural rehab therapy. I had years and years of mental disability because of all these concussions because I pushed it too hard. And yeah. I learned, right? And so did you. But I'm saying the first thing you got to do is be aware. Be aware. Yeah. M my dad had a different bit of advice. Um his his went something along the lines of if you're going to be dumb, you got to be tough. Um, <laughs> yeah. There's, there's and, some truth. <laughs> oh, it's very true. And, and, you know, it took a long time to come out of that mentality and, and be slightly less dumb. So it doesn't require me to be so tough, um, which tough to see and resilience is, is a good thing to have. Um, but, you know, you would ideally should have to use that sparingly, not that shouldn't be your default setting, right? right. Where we're like, well, I'm just going to do this the dumb hard way every time. Not to be confused with, uh, um, you know, we talked about instant gratification and prolonged gratification, right? Yeah. Again, they can get kind of like, well, yeah, if it's hard, then I need to do it. And it's like, well, listen, slamming my head into a brick wall is hard. You yeah. know, but it doesn't mean that it's good. So we, we still have to have the understand the nuance of just because something is difficult and challenging. Right. And maybe there is an easier way to do it. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean it's more valuable or that we're going to get the same result by going this route or the other route. And so, that, again, again, this is where it's hard for kids this is where it's difficult because, yeah. you know, I'm giving advice and it's somewhat on the surface conflicting. This is where a guide and a mentor is really yeah. you know, invaluable so they can help explain and, and direct some of that nuance. Well, one of the things that I think everyone should remember is that your body is always a reliable indicator of your choices. So mm. if, you're, if you're having a hard time finding the, the line of therapeutic pain and growth pain versus disabling pain, then your body's going to tell you the truth. If your mind can't make the judgment, listen to your body. There's yeah. no question, right? It's like, well, look at your body, like, right? Is it getting look, better? You know, it, look worse. at your body. I mean, physically looking at it, am, yeah. am I improving in the ways, you know, am, is it, is it performing in better ways? 
Or yeah. is this thing, am I getting just more battered and beat up? Am I looking, you know, less aesthetically, not to say that aesthetics are the end all be all, but you know, if your skin looks unhealthy, man, it's probably a good indication that you're doing something wrong. Yeah. I'll give you an example of, of the kind of stupidity that I'm warning about. <laughs> when I was, when I was young and in high school, I don't know what drove this sort of craze, but guys used to challenge each other to who could hold a lit cigarette against their back of their hand mm. the longest and they would time it. And they kept trying to get me involved in that. And I would say, okay, I've got one for you. How about you come to my house and we'll see how many hay bales you can lift before you're fucking exhausted because at least we can put some hay in the barn. Right. But accomplish all something. You, all you're going to do is leave a hole in your hand and have a scar for the rest of your life. And to me, that's not smart at all. I don't need to prove that I'm tough because the better I do, the stupider I am. Right. Right. So the, yeah. the you see, the, the, this is what I mean by having discernment because young people without a lot of depth try to trick each other into doing really dumb shit. Like, let's see who can drink the most alcohol and drive home. Right. Yeah. That's not smart. That's that's a great mm -hmm. way to ruin your life and someone else's. Or end it but, completely. Totally. Exactly. That's a ruining for sure. Yeah. Just because I want to make sure we don't forget. Could you give yes. us an overview of, of your Savage Gentleman Forum? Because when I was on your website and looked at it, I read your website. I yeah. really loved what you're, what you're about there. And I think for young people, even knowing, young men, knowing about the Savage Gentleman, I think it's fantastic. So give us the overview of the Savage Gentleman. I was going to share my one, two, three, four model, but we're so late into this thing. I think I'm I'll sorry. save it for I, I a keep... No, no, it's, no okay. it's not you at all. I'm having a good time. And I think what we're <laughs> talking about is important because really, you know, the fact that we've been talking for about three hours and we still have a lot to say is a statement. Becoming yeah. a man takes time. You can't talk about it in a podcast. In fact, you couldn't do it in five because no, no matter how much talking there is, you got to go out and go through the mill of life. And that's where you find out what the truth is. You're not going to get it on the internet. You can't get it by mm -hmm. listening. You can't, you got to go do it. It lies in the doing. Yeah. Talk about Savage Gentleman, then tell us about the offers that you wanted to give the listeners. Yeah. So Savage Gentleman is the business that we created around this idea. Um, again, of seemingly conflicting concepts, right? The dichotomy of both being a savage and then also a gentleman. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's this yin yang. It's this, you know, push pull idealized state, right? The, the, the drive of it, the crux of it is that we want men to become the, the greatest expression of themselves. Right. And, and the term we use for that is a savage gentleman because it embodies both aspects. It's not just one side of the coin or the other. It's, it's all of it. It's an all encompassing, um, term. And so we, we have a company that we make leather goods and products. We have men's apparel. We have all these, these trinkets and, and products that kind of center around this idea, right? We, we make them with, with an intention, right? Of, of the quality and, you know, an aesthetic and products that, that guys, need and use, but really that's to keep the lights on for pushing this idea that, man, we need to band together. We need to rally behind an idea of, of improving ourselves. We can't just be rest on our laurels. Yeah. And be passive, right? We need to be constantly working on either our savage or our gentleman side. And then, like I said, I can't tell you what percentage of one to the other you need, I'm just here to have you ask the question of, okay, where do I, am I, am I being too savage? Do I need to develop my gentleman side a little bit more or have I spent too much time on the gentleman side and I need to go and get my hands dirty and, and sleep outside in the dirt or whatever. And so with that, we have our podcast where we talk about these ideas. You know, I, I, I occasionally I'll be inspired and I'll write some blog articles delving into just a lot of my own findings and experience. and. The, the biggest outreaching arm that we have is our is our closed Facebook group called the League of Savage Gentlemen. And this is this is our community where guys can actually interact. And yes, it is a digital format, which is you know no substitute for 
in-person interaction, but it is a good start. And so when we talked about finding a tribe and man, where do I find other guys that share some of the same values, guys that are maybe going through similar experiences or have gone through and they have some knowledge and some insights. This is a place where we can kind of come and discuss and ask questions where, and, and, and get, you know, sincere answers. It, it's, it's tough on the internet. You just post something to your, you know, social media and you're going to get all kinds of people coming out of the woodwork to tell you why you're an idiot or make fun of you or post memes or do whatever. Uh, this is a little bit more somber tone where we're, we're really actively trying to help each other out because we understand that's the only way forward. You know, there's so many guys that never had that role model or, or positive male influence to teach them the things. You know, if you yeah. were a kid and didn't grow up knowing how to hunt, now you're a 40 year old man, where are you going to go to gain that knowledge? You, you have to find people. And so, you know, we, we've, we've got about 20,000 guys in the group. And then, you know, the, the goal is to then have them actually interacting in person, finding guys that are in your area, you know, that maybe you've met online and have passed, you know, passed that initial barrier of like, oh, okay. Yeah. You're, you're on the level, right? You're someone that I can trust and someone I can learn from and then going out and doing the things. And so that's kind of the next evolution that we're working on now is how do we accomplish that in person? So that's, that's kind of one of my goals for this year is to actualize this into something beyond just a digital forum where guys can talk um, and in, engage and making it an in-person event kind of uh, entity. So that's, the, the very as brief of an overview as I think I'm capable of giving. <laughs> That's great. Why don't you tell us, Josh, what your offers for the Living 4D listeners are? I'm super excited for you to share your Declaration of Independence. I think that's a beautiful offer you got there. Yeah, so we have a leather Declaration of Independence. Uh, it's it's made out of 100% full grain cowhide, and we engrave that with the Declaration of Independence. And then we inlay that with gold. And so now you have this like really pristine piece of artwork that, man, I think we have, <laughs> unfortunately, it seems we've forgotten the meaning of, of really what that document actually stated and, and the, the profundity of it and how important that is to this nation. It's something that I feel really passionate about that I, that I wish more people just man, could use the reminder of and, and could could have access to and just just even as a token, as a reminder. Uh, so so we make that it's it's man, I, I could give you the dimensions. It's a it's a pretty good size. It's a, it's a solid hunk of leather. And what I'd like to do is honestly, I, I want to push that. But really, I think for you, Paul, we can just do the entire store discount. OK, okay. we'll do 10 percent on the order. I mean, that's the item that I'd really like to push the for people to check out, but really if they see anything that they like that we make, I'd happy to do, you know, we could do, let's do a 10% discount on that. We'll use the, the code check 10 at savagegentleman.com is our website. And so that'll be good on, on any purchase that your listeners make that they can get some cool savage gentleman gear. And Man, it, it really goes a long way into supporting what we do. You know, the again, we talked about material items and it's not about stuff, but, you know, the world does operate off of, you know, financial resources. And so, yeah, man, it's it, it, it does help a lot when, you know, even if it's a T-shirt or something like that, you know, people kind of carrying the torch. Not only are you supporting the mission, but you're you're spreading the word inadvertently. You know, you're kind of vicariously or you're just you're getting it out to people. And that's, that's a really big thing. Well, I think being a savage gentleman is a beautiful balance of, of, uh, the reality and, and, uh, and love, you know, and, mm. uh, uh, with the check 10, does it have to be any special case? No, it, it won't be, it won't be case sensitive. You can enter it any kind of way you want to. It'll be at checkout. So as you, you know, fill up your cart, put whatever, whatever you want in it, definitely check out the declarations of independence. And when you put that in, that'll apply it. I don't, they, the system won't let you combine it with anything else, unfortunately. So you can't stack them. I, I'm not smart enough to know how to, <laughs> how to work around that. 
but you know, hopefully, you know, that'll be a, just a little bit of icing on the cake for, for folks to go and check out some of the things that we have. And like I said, support this idea of trying to help men become the best version of themselves. Again, being that the, the greatest version of, of who are they, who they were created to be. I love it. I thought uh, when I looked at your, your web store there, I thought the products looked very high quality and everything looks really like quality made. Uh, you know, it, it looked to me like you put some time and energy to, to create quality stuff. There was a lot. I mean, again, that harkens back to the intentionality, right? I mean, the savage gentleman is intentional. And so our products reflect that, you know, we're, we're making what I like to think of heirloom pieces, right? Something that could be passed down for generations. And you'll see, we have kind of a vintage aesthetic that harkens back to a time of craftsmanship where people made stuff to last, not this, you know, fly by night mass manufacturing of just, you know, Chinese. turn and burn. <laughs> Chinese yeah, quick it's stuff. Cheap. yeah. As cheap as you can make it to get it out the door. We really try to use the highest quality, you know, materials and, and, and production that we, we possibly can. Yeah. Well, fantastic. I've really enjoyed our, our dialogue. You know, we've had a oh, great man. sharing and I think we covered a lot of really important issues. You know, I wish we had time to go through everything <laughs> that we worked on in the outline because we put a lot of effort into it, but we yeah. can, we can do another podcast and, and loop back and go beyond this one uh, when we, when we can make it happen. And I, and I, I just really think we talked about a lot of things. If you had a one sentence statement for the young men of the world, as we close, what's your one sentence tip for navigating manhood? Gain experience. I, I would just, I would just encourage them to gain experience and man, I, I wish, I wish I was the one who came up with it, but you know, I just heard a really smart guy say something to the effect of learning to follow your heart. And, uh, uh I, <laughs> I, I, I just, I have to second that notion, you know, follow your heart and use that heart to guide you to gain experience and continue to pursue that. And man, you're, you're going to figure some things out and, and you'll get there eventually, you know, don't be in a rush. It will come. If I could go back in time and tell myself something as a young, budding young man, it's like, Hey, just, just keep going. Don't give up yeah. Keep going. And you're going to get pace there. yourself, pace yourself for sure. Pace yourself. And I probably could have paced a lot better, but, um, you know, keep, keep going and you'll get there. Well, I'm going to share something short and sweet that was drilled into us very heavily, not only in training to be a paratrooper, but every day I was in the zero one priority unit, which means you're the first one to go to war. So you're on red alert almost constantly. It's very intense. And on our shoulders, we have a patch that has two capital A's on it, which actually stands for all American. But that's not what they put into our head. Put into our head that those two A's represent always alert. Mm. And if you're not always alert, you end up dead as a paratrooper or an elite soldier. So if I have any advice for young people in the world today, young men especially, pretend you got two A's on your shoulder at all times to remind you to pay attention, pay attention to what you're believing in, pay attention to whether or not you're evaluating your own judgments and thoughts, pay attention, attention to whether someone's bullshitting you or whether they're an authentic teacher, leader, or guide, or they're just a prop up on the internet, pay attention to what your heart's telling you, pay attention to what your body's telling you, stay alert and stay alive. That's it. Stay alert and stay alive. Always alert means stay alert and stay alive. And uh, I think for all the reasons we're all aware of in the world right now, we all need to keep our eye on the ball and not get distracted by the bullshit. So my mm -hmm. final comment is stay alert and stay alive. Yeah, I agree. Well, I'll close by saying thank you to all of you for listening. If you've listened to us this far, then I'm sure you're <laughs> actually really interested in being a real man in contributing to the world. And if you haven't listened and you're still hearing my voice, then maybe listen to it again. <laughs> and thank you for all of you for contributing because we need real men and healthy women in the world right now for obvious reasons. And I will say thank you to my sponsors for your amazing 
sustainable practices and products that actually work and do what they say they'll do. And thank you to any of you that buy products from the sponsors because it supports the podcast. So I can keep rounding up amazing guys like Josh to help hang up the shingle of knowledge for us all. So uh, Josh, it's been a great pleasure, man. I'm giving you a great big man hug through the internet. And Hey, uh, back at you. Uh, look forward to staying in touch with you. And um, it's a pleasure to meet a savage gentleman. Oh, thanks. Wyatt. Well, you know, it takes one to know one. So it was, it was really my pleasure to, to come on here and, and just, man, sh- gain some of the knowledge and insight that you have. It's always a real treat. And I always walk away, you know, feeling better informed than, than I was before. So thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. I'll thank Julia. Ross yes, at please. Gaia for connecting us because uh, I think she had some women's intuition that you and I would do something good for the world together. And I think we've just gave it our best shot. We, we tried. We, we tried. You know, the work still continues. But I mean, this was a good, good first step, I feel like. All right. Well, lots of love to all of you guys. Have a great rest of your day and uh, look forward to sharing something amazing with you next week. Bye bye. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Josh Tyler. You can follow Josh on Instagram at Josh Tyler MMA or at Savage Gentleman Official. You can also visit the Savage Gentleman website at savagegentleman.com and get 10% off anything and everything in the entire store using the promo code CHECK10. That's C H E K 10. Make sure to check out the copy of the Declaration of Independence engraved on leather and inlaid with gold, which can be framed or hung directly on your wall. You can find Paul on Instagram and TikTok at paul.check, on Twitter at paulcheck, or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash living 4 d with Paul Check. You can watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com or visit the Czech Institute site at checkinstitute.com to find Paul's e-learning courses, advanced training programs, and to learn more about the Czech Academy. You can read the show notes and find links to the resources mentioned in this episode at checkinstitute.com forward slash podcast. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review at the top of the show page on Spotify or at the bottom of the show page if you are listening on Apple Podcasts.